2024. The time is flying by, and I am joined by my colleagues, Council Members Blumenfield, Rodriguez, and Harris Dawson. Council Member Lee will not be here today. Mr. Verano, can you please call the roll? Council Member Rahman. I am here. Council Member Blumenfield. Present. Council Member Harris Dawson. Present. Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Council Member Lee, absent. Four members and a quorum, Madam Chair. Okay, great. And I am having tr a little bit of trouble hearing um, hearing Mr. Verano, and so I don't know whether maybe it's because of your mask. Okay, that's fine. All right, we have 16 items to consider on today's agenda. Mo uh, a number of them will be moving forward on consent. Item one is an RFP for legal service providers uh, that are uh, funded through ULA for the anti-tenant harassment program. Uh, or the tenant anti-harassment program. Um, item two is a motion uh, to explore the need for project-based vouchers to fulfill the city's affordable and supportive housing pipelines. And I'm gonna recommend that we continue this item to the next meeting. Item three is a motion regarding recent insurance increases faced by supportive and affordable housing providers uh, and what state and federal action can be taken to mitigate this. Item four is a motion regarding the shortage of behavioral health providers, identifying organizations who are currently providing these services and, and identifying some strategies to improve the coordination of service delivery with, with the city, um, something which is badly needed. Item five is a motion uh, for a project home key site for seniors at 9120 Woodman Avenue and CD6 and some additional funding. Uh, item six is a CAO report regarding the city's role in the CARE Court program. And this report, if you read it, was really a summary of what the CARE Court is doing. Um, the city has less of a role in it, but I think it is a very important uh, piece of new policy circumstances that we should learn more about. Item seven is a CLA report regarding the feasibility of operating a master lease program to expand the number of units available for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and I'm gonna offer an amendment for this item. Uh, I just wanna amend the first recommendation in this report to read, instruct the CAO and the CLA with the assistance of the city attorney and the housing department. Uh, actually, let me, let me come back to these amendments um, in a moment. Yeah, let me come back to this amendment. Apologies for that. Item eight is an MFC report regarding the Mayfair Hotel, which we've heard uh, about in this committee prior, and we'll be hearing an update on how that is progressing, as well as some new costs. Item nine is an LAHD report about an ex exclusive negotiation agreement to acquire and rehabilitate affordable housing on city-owned property in CD9. Item 10 is a report from the Homelessness Strategy Committee about filling HET team vacancies and approving losses, scope of work for the housing system navigator position. And we actually heard the first iteration of this presentation uh, at the end of last year um, in this committee, so nothing in this should come as much of a surprise to members of this committee. Item 11 is a report from the Prop HHH Administrative Oversight Committee regarding extending the commitment letters um, for the Permanent Supportive Housing Loan Program. Item 12 is a report from the Administrative Oversight Committee regarding amending the project expenditure plan for uh, fiscal year 2021, 20 to 21. Item 13 uh, is a LASA report uh, regarding the housing and homeless incentive program priorities for the Los Angeles continuum of care. Item 14 is the 11th HEA inside safe reports from the CAO. Item 15 is the 22nd roadmap report from the CAO. And item 16 is a CAO report regarding funding for the pilot RV to home recreational vehicle recycling program. And I believe we have a, an amendment for this one as well. That's correct, Madam Chair. Would you like for me to read it in the record? Sure. Instruct the city administrative officer with assistance from the Los Angeles Police Department to provide a report to replenish funds for the city recreational vehicle program to the Los Angeles Police Department, fund number 100-70, account number 003040, contractual services for the recycling of recreational vehicles once the account reaches $250,000 for this fiscal year, with an estimated cost to continue funding through the next fiscal year. And I'll be seconding that uh, amendment. 
Uh, and with that, we can move to public comment. So I will now take public comment on all items. I want to make sure we have our interpreter here. Uh, and uh, let's have our city attorney, Mei Mei Chang, uh, give us some guidance. Thank you. Um, to members of the public, when it is your turn to speak, please state the name you signed up under, which agenda items you'd like to speak on, and whether or not you would like to provide general public comment. You'll have one minute per item, up to two minutes total for items on the agenda, and one minute for general public comment, for a maximum speaking time for up to three minutes per person. Please speak to the agenda items before beginning general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on topic, you will get one brief warning from me or the committee chair. If you do not immediately and clearly get back on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, so let's have our... Um First speaker, I'm going to call up all of our speakers, which Arnold Sachs and Brad West, if you want to come up. Okay, and I will read the amendment um, for item seven at this time as well. So this will just amend the first recommendation to add the phrase um, or other feasible sites in the city after pilot program in Council District 5. So it'll just, the whole recommendation, first recommendation will now read, instruct the CAO and CLA with the assistance of the city attorney and the housing department to prepare contract terms, program metrics and benchmarks, and other necessary program elements to implement the LASA master leasing program in the city, including master leasing of scattered sites, starting with a pilot program in Council District 5 or other feasible sites in the city and report to Council in 60 days. And uh, we'll just remove the phrase uh, for the Council District 5 uh, from the second, uh, second recommendation. And if I could get a second for that. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. What items are you speaking on? Item number three. Okay. You have one minute. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Brad West. I'm with the Supportive Housing Alliance, which is a coalition of a dozen of LA's most experienced supporters of housing developers. Uh, together, we've developed about 7,500 units of supportive housing across Los Angeles. Um, I just wanted to come today to support item number three. For those of you who don't know, um, the insurance market is absolutely going haywire, um, in, uh, and especially in the supportive housing world, where many of our top insurance providers are exiting the market entirely, which is jacking up costs even more. Um, all of our members are experiencing cost increases of at least 25%, some as high as literally 500 and 50%. Um, it has made it so that some projects are literally not penciling out anymore at all, and so I really appreciate the City Council's interest in finding out just how deep this crisis is, and hopefully that can inform how best we can do to solve it here at the local level. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. What items are you going to be speaking on? What items are you speaking on, sir? I am speaking on item public comment, item number one. Okay, you have two minutes. I have another couple of items I'd also like to speak on. Okay, you have three minutes. Number... Two minutes for the items and one minute okay. for general public so comment. So am I speaking on the items or general public comment? You can start with the items and then move to general public comment. Okay, item number one, again, is phony bullshit. It's united to house LA. You need to have the periods. It's very important because then you don't get federal money. You mentioned ULA. Mm -hmm. You left out the house. You don't have a house, then you're not united to do anything. It's united to house LA protections or LA. It's not ULA. It's UHLA. Very important. The devil's in the detail. This is such a load of crap. You keep running the same scams all the time. Any scam is a good scam unless you get caught. Now, item number three refers to insurance increases. There's a lack of insurance companies. I don't know if you've noticed. There's an actual lack of insurance companies anymore. There are no more insurance companies, at least automobile insurance companies. 
I don't know about home insurance companies. I'm not sure they exist anymore. Most of them have been bankrupt. They've stolen all their, their, their retirement funds. Item number um, seven, uh, item number four, item number nine refers to rehabilitate affordable housing on city-owned property. If you own the city-owned property, then what do you have to pay for? The city owns the property. What does it cost to rehabilitate a home? Why can't you use MICLA funds, municipal issued city of Los Angeles bond? They used them over here at the, the project over here on the corner of Grand and First Street, just like they used HHH bond money when it was supposed to be for affordable housing. But they didn't get affordable housing. Who lives in this apartment building at the corner of Grand and First? It was HHH money that was passed by the city for all people to pay that bond. Public comment? Yes, one minute. Oh, okay. Um, this committee is housing and homelessness. Mm -hmm. I just got out of a committee meeting that said housing and homeless. What's going on? How do you have homeless and then homelessness and then stupidnessness? You're just stealing public funds. It's been a steal of public funds ever since they stole all that federal dollars, ever since LA Care was changed. This is private company. You could run all this stuff right through this. Yeah, I know, it's all the drugs in LA. Drug capital of America. Too bad we had a, we had a cartel leader right here in LA County, supervisor for the third district, fourth district. Remember that shit about sickle cell anemia. You need that low cost care. Somebody did away on this county board of supervisors agenda. Thank you very much for your time and attention. More equality. Thank you. And I believe that's all our speakers for today. Anybody else here want to speak? Okay, great. Um, so let's close public comment. Um, and so I'm going to recommend, as I said earlier, that we continue item two to our next meeting and take the following items on consent as amended. Um, one, three through six, nine, 11 through 12, and 15 and 16. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to call items one and six special. Okay. Let's have a couple quick questions on those. Okay. One, so one is the um, RFP, right? And it's item six is the is care the court. Care court. Brief okay. questions, but okay, that's fine. So that means we'll take three through five, nine, eleven, and twelve, and fifteen and sixteen on consent as amended. Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. Can you call the roll, Mr. Rano? Yes, Madam Chair. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Lee, absent. Four eyes, and these items are approved with 16 as amended. Okay, great. Uh, no, there are two amendments, right, in that? Uh, the other amendment is for item number seven, and that one is. Oh, which uh, we're going to hear. You're address. right, Correct. sorry. That's right. You're better at this. Um, okay, great. So why don't we start off with um, let's do item seven and 13 together, which is the master leasing and the HHIP items. Uh, since they're connected, we can do the two questions immediately after that and then move into the Mayfair item. Yep. Okay. So if you could read item seven and 13 into the record. Item number seven is a chief legislative analyst report relative to the feasibility of operating a master lease program to expand the number of available units for individ individuals experiencing homelessness within Council District 5 and a proposed structure and potential funding sources for a citywide master leasing program and related matters. Item number 13 is a Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority report relative to housing and homelessness uh, housing and homeless incentive program priorities for the Los Angeles continuum of care. Okay, great. And we have Pranita Matia here from the CLA. We have Thomas Wong here from Lhasa, is that right? Great. And if you wanna get started with your presentation we can move into discussion as quickly as possible. 
Good afternoon. My name is Pranita Amatya from the office of the CLA. Um, I'll give a very brief uh, presentation on the mass release report. This report provides council with a comprehensive overview of the mass releasing program developed by LASA and the County of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, the report aimed to evaluate the feasibility of establishing a mass release program in the city with potential opportunities for expansion. The report describes a proposed program that LASA has been developing and the funding associated with it. The report also lays out the structural foundation of creating uh, a similar program in the city. And finally, the report provides recommendations to implement the program with the pilot in CD5 and then to e expand it citywide. We are here for uh, any questions, unless you want me to talk about the report more. I mean, I think it would be helpful to understand why the HHIP funds are being included as part of this discussion. Um, yeah, I think sure. it would be good to get a little bit more than that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the mass releasing program um, that LASA has developed has been supported by the HHIP program through uh, the support of Los Angeles County. Um, does LASA want to talk about the, yeah. HHIP. Why don't you talk about, uh, I think it would be useful for people just to understand the HHIP program, the source of those funds, and uh, the expectation that these will continue on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I, I can speak on to that. Uh, greetings all, Thomas Wong, Unit Acquisitions Associate Director at LASA. Um, the HHIP funding source is a funding source uh, made possible through the partnership of LA County and the managed care plans, LA Care and HealthNet. Um, those dollars are specifically um, supporting the operational expenses, um, what they are calling as backfill expenses, um, to sustain these master lease projects. Um, some examples of those costs may be repairs and maintenance to the property, uh, the property management, um, the utilities, the insurances. Um, so those funds are quite critical to just the overall sustainability of the project and program. And those will be an ongoing source of funds, not subject to budgetary fluctuations. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. The HIP funds do not have a, a, an expenditure deadline, which is advantageous to the terms of the master lease agreements that are entered into with the property owners. Okay. And you mentioned that uh, HHIP will pay for backfill expenses, and you listed some of those. Again, I, have, uh, I just didn't hear all of it. If you could just share what those backfill expenses are. Um, I also think we would benefit uh, yeah, benefit just from a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of what that is. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the backfill expenses would include the property management uh, fee, uh, the repairs and maintenance of the, the entire property to just maintain the day-to-day, um, -day, again, just uh, clean up, um, keeping the, the property habitable, um, um, repairing any property damages that may be caused uh, due to the tenant's use of the property. Um, things of that nature. And what scale are those um, funding requirements usually for those backfill expenses? Because um, those, those are basically your additional operating costs for each project, right? That is correct. And that's the total of the operating costs? There's no additional subsidies needed in order to, or additional funding sources needed in order to move these projects forward? Uh, there is additional funding sources that are being um, interwoven to, in support um, along with the HIP funds. Uh, Measure H is one. Um, there is also funds that are coming through the actual um, rent revenues. They're, meaning they're connected to the vouchers? Correct. Okay. Great. Um, and then I also understand that there is already a functional pilot operating at five sites for a master leasing program that's being run through LASA. Can you share a little bit more about that pilot? Uh, I know three or four of these are in the city of Los Angeles. Can you tell us how many units are being leased, where they are, are they full, how long has the pilot been operational, what are the next steps? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are, correct, four sites that are within the city of LA. One is in the county of LA, unincorporated, um, which totals about 105 units. Um, all are leased up. Um, the, prop, uh, the pilot launched formally November 15th. Um, so a total of 105 units across all five sites? That's correct, yes. And, and all of them are full? Correct. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and then more are in the pipeline. Um, 
So we have currently 145 that are in route towards contracting for the month of February, this month, um, and 387 are in the pipeline for, with negotiations and various levels of inspections. Okay, great. Um, other questions from members of the committee? Go ahead, Ms. Rodriguez. Yes, um, so uh, you indicated that four of the sites are in the city of Los Angeles, and I'm just trying to ascertain what is the extent of the contractual uh, master leasing program of uh, of the four sites uh, so you said 115 units across all five uh, how much is it do you have a breakout of uh, how many sites and uh, units within the city of Los Angeles uh, yes a uh, total of 105 and then t um, the single site that is within the county is 20 units yeah I don't care I don't care about the county one and uh, the only reason so why like I'm asking my, yeah. you have to understand why I'm asking is because we have an obligation under the Alliance settlement to to achieve a certain number of units so are these units qualified under that and maybe for someone from the CAO yes okay they are so if they are my question is is why how were these uh, 105 units, how were they identified? We've got a number, if Los is picking up the tab and we're doing this, uh, and the city is, you know, we've got this $250 million effort under Inside Safe that is not achieving a master leasing program that is helping to fulfill the obligations of the Alliance Settlement, why aren't we using the same model or structure to approach some of the uh, identified motel rooms, especially if this is also obligating the county to provide the services. Is, is that what I understood? Under this, un, under this, uh, under this effort, uh, the county is picking up the tab on the services? Not, not necessarily uh, in total. You so talked this, about uh, pr management, uh, maintenance. So for, for the uh, management costs, uh, it, at this point it is funded through HIP and uh, county resources. In terms of services, um, those come under uh, different auspices. So uh, folks that were moving in with time-limited subsidies, those services uh, are attached to whatever the f funding source for that time-limited subsidy may be. So they may be city-funded, they may be county-funded, uh, but they're contracted through the um, time-limited subsidy provider. We're also working uh, to bring in folks who have tenant-based vouchers uh, so that we have a stable revenue source uh, to uh, try to make these buildings more budget-neutral. Um, and for those folks, those services are provided through the county, through their uh, ICMS, the Intensive Case Management Services contracts. So when did this, this uh, source of revenue to fund this effort, when did this all come online? This HIP. Um, the HIP um, was recently contracted um, with, uh, with LASA through the county CEO HI office. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a relatively new um, uh, resource solely and specifically for um, master leasing and some other unit acquisition um, activities and programs. Where are these four sites located? They are, I don't know how these um, specific addresses currently. Um, Roughly, do you know the council six. districts? Yeah, spouse, uh, I don't have the council districts, unfortunately, um, right here, right now. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, to get that list. Do you know? I don't know the specific council districts. They are, the first sites are all in South LA. Um, because we had uh, uh, ongoing relationships with some landlords that had properties in development. Um, so we wanted to work with uh, developers and landlords that we already had relationships with. Uh, Tom and his team uh, are doing, uh, scouring the entire county, uh, trying to develop re relationships with landlords. Uh, we're not looking at just doing sole, um, single properties, but also being able to do uh, scattered site, so if we can get blocks of units within larger com uh, uh, large apartment complexes or even potentially one-off units uh, in smaller complexes, we're interested in that as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess, you know, this is, listen, any, any penny we can get out of the county to actually do their share is a welcomed opportunity the way I see it, because uh, we keep uh, getting saddled with the bills and see no relief in sight. My question is, is that when all these new uh, sources of revenue keep coming online, uh, what, do you guys have like a matrix of the source of the money of where it's coming from and what can apply to? Because it just gets all muddled to me. And I don't understand how you guys even identify which opportunity can align to a property, to an eligible site. It just seems like a, you know, just like a scattered mess. 
Uh, I'd like to invite perhaps Katie Porter to come with her whiteboard to figure out how we might be able to get this all squared away because uh, we just need a, a, a whiteboard and some uh, dry erase markers. But it doesn't seem like there's any clear uh, delineation of the sources of funds, the eligibility, so that we can actually get a better sense of it because if everyone keeps coming to tap our general fund, which we've already know is exhausted, and I want to thank the controller for finally recognizing that that is the future outlook of our city budget, uh, it's not going to work. So I want to know, and Ed, maybe you can answer this, uh, but this is all kind of catching my attention to here's another source and what are we doing to tap into it. Fair. Ed Gibson, CAO's office. So. I think part of these conversations, I want to go back um, in talking with LASA and stuff, probably through most of last year about this program, and I, I know I provided a good number of comments, good crew listening through, so uh, we have been part of this for a while. The HIP money was the, is the health care money, and they came, and I want to say it was about summertime, saying Ed, that they could Ed, pay can for... can you pull the mic closer? Oh, sure can. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, they pointed out that they could pay for a number of sources, a number of items, but they couldn't pay for rent. And so, but they could participate. And so that's how you get these things that go around. When you look at the overall structure of master leasing and um, as, as it looks down, you take, I'm gonna say, you take control of a new construction building because you're not gonna you know, relocate anybody. You, you say you're gonna pay for primarily all the units just to make it simple at least them, you drop them in with either um, time-limited subsidy or a Section 8 voucher, existing resources, existing resources, preferably a Section 8 voucher. Then that unit becomes self-sustaining and it comes off of what I like to say, what is the city dollar us paying for these, paying for rent and everything over and over again. And it becomes also a stabilized item because the Section 8 voucher will continue to pay without a term on it, like a time-limited a time -limited subsidy. One of the key pieces that's in, inside of the, the program as it's been set up, there's a lot of money moving around because Section 8 has rules, the owner is gonna have rules, property management, and so it has a fiscal agent in there to make sure all the, a bonded <laughs> fiscal agent to make sure all the money is getting into the, to the right place. So it's a reuse kind of, of existing sources, and I'll say in a more, I'm gonna say for lack of a better word, creative way about putting them together in one place. I know, fair enough. <laughs> um, fair enough. And the eight chip money that came in kind of was one of the pieces that makes a lot of this possible because all of a sudden someone showed up with some money that was flexible, that was new to the system, that could plug and solve a problem. And they were willing to listen and, and move forward, and particularly with a pilot. But so, as Thomas said, I mean, it is new, new. Yeah, so if new, we, new. I mean, I think this is why I think a slightly more detailed elaboration of what the program was would have been helpful up top because I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a program that is made possible through operational subsidies from Medi-Cal, which is a new source of funds. Um, and I think it opens up the possibility for us to do more master leasing with, without having significant city funds, but with us taking on some of the le in, initial lease obligations. And so it's a different kind of um, burden that we're taking on in this process. But ultimately, it's a good thing because the voucher money is paying for much of the cost. And then the operational costs are being paid through uh, either the ICMS dollars and uh, combined with the HIP funds, right? And I'm going to say that is, that is a lovely recap. That is correct. Right. We mentioned this in our... Um, December report as well. Yes. Um, we knew the CLA, we thought their report was coming out at that time at the same time as the Alliance report, so you could hear these two things together. And so I guess I would just say, you know, the, the master leasing report is from, the motion was passed like a, over a year ago, I think, through the council. In some ways, LASA doing this pilot has moved us beyond the point of a pilot, and it's really just trying to think about how can we expand this across the city um, as long as it is not significantly fiscally burdening our, our city further. And it sounds like because of the addition of the HIP dollars that that is actually happening. I would say yes. Sorry, I don't want to speak for, for loss of, I, I feel like I have a lot of hours in on this, on this topic. I also want to be clear about 
when the structure of this was going around, so was the thought of the requirements of alliance and the term and, and, uh, and the risks and the costs and all of those things were in consideration. So when you end up with the final program that LASA has at the current moment, it has all of those things kind of into the consideration. Most things being around, we talked about five-year terms, we talked, you know, how you structure it to make it actually work, yes. that you get credit for it, that the services get covered under Alliance. This, this is one of the tools that's in the toolbox that's going to be very important for us. Yes, yeah, so the pilot is actually already done in some ways. So Pardon? Can, the pilot is done yeah. in, in some ways. Okay, are, are there other questions from members of the committee? Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah. Thank you. Um, appreciate the report. I, I want to focus for a moment on, on 13 because it's related to all this. It was a, a year and a half ago or more, I started asking the questions about HIP. I, I had had uh, a lunch with a former colleague in the assembly who's on the LA CARES, and he said, you guys are missing the boat. You're missing, there's all this HIP money you could be using for things uh, such as navigators. Uh, <laughs> even though we couldn't do it, but our service providers could do it. And I started asking questions about that, and I put together a motion a year and a half ago uh, which is item 13, asking these questions about how we could use this money for services because I didn't want to see the money left on the table and I feel like we've been leaving it on the table for the last year and a half and, and, and I, I'm disappointed with the report on 13 because it talks about the TLS but it doesn't go into the services. It doesn't answer the actual questions that were in the motion. Specifically, the motion said a year and a half ago, um, move the CLA, CIO uh, report on the, the local homeless plan and investment plan submitted to the DHS on how the city can be an active partner in meeting the priorities set by HIP. On, and then also to report on the future funding needed to continue to expand street medicine and mobile health mental health van programs in the city using HIP. Uh, a further instruct CAO, CLA with the assistance of LASA to report on how much funding could be supplanted, supplanted from current expenditures on housing navigation and other sustaining services with HIP, such as master leasing and things like that, because we're spending general fund money when we could be supplanting that money with HIP dollars. I further move um, priorities, blah, 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 HIP priorities shared with managed health care plans, along with the budget for housing navigation and housing sustaining services for this current fiscal year, and then uh, report on the health, mental health, and behavioral health of people experiencing homelessness and how to align the deliver of these services with the priorities of HIP. Unfortunately, I don't see the answers to any of those questions in this report. Um, and it's exactly what we're talking about, which is how do, we, how do we better leverage OPM, other people's money? How do we go with the feds and, and use it? And this is great. I mean, the master leasing is, is great. Um, we should be doing as much as, a, as we can. Um, I don't want to just complain about it. Is there a reason that we, we weren't able to answer any of these questions? I guess this is more CAO, CLA question, but. Um, Welcome, Mr. Wickham. Yeah. And, and I know you guys work hard and do great work. I just, I, I have to say, I just, this report didn't cut it for me. Um, the report that is on the file now was in response to the one uh, paragraph directing loss at a report. So uh, um, the loss report came in ad in advance of the report that the CLA has been working on with the support of LASA and the CAO. Our report is absolutely imminent. It was, we're just like a couple of days away. And so they, di they didn't match up. Okay. Um, we have the answers to those questions coming forward to you. Um, they should be available at your next meeting um, if you want to schedule that report at that time. Uh, we've been, our staff have been working with the MCPs who receive the money and um, they actually have not been receiving the bulk of the money yet, from what I understand. And so we're, we're not too far behind. Um, and we do have some information on the housing navigation component of, in that as well, and your question about the supplantation. But we're very close to having that report on the council file. Okay, because I, I thought that's what this 13 was, was the, was the response to this. Yeah, it was, yeah, the, the item 13 had the loss of report, but not the CLA report, which had not been released yet. It, it's, so it's coming. It's part of the report, I guess, is what I'm hearing. And that's yeah. fine. We're happy to schedule the full report when it comes in. I did think that the master leasing item did not make that much sense without the HIP. Uh, well, it's, it's, all, it's all the same. I mean, 
it's how do we use these dollars? And, and it's, you know, it's been a year and a half since the, this motion, and, and I don't know how much money we've left on the table already, but it, it feels like there's money we can be using for, for, for master leasing, for all this good stuff. Yeah. Um, so great, I look forward to that. I won't belabor the point on that. Um, did have a couple of questions even on the, on the, the first part. The, in the uh, CLA report, it says, LASA has stated that this is intended to be an encampment to unit program with a focus on getting individuals from inside safe encampment resolution into the master leased units, which is great. Uh, but can you elaborate on that? Is this, is this the exit strategy for, for the inside safe motels? Um, in our conversations with LASA, LASA had talked about their collaboration with the mayor's office to place um, people experiencing homelessness in the encampments that were being resolved, getting, taking those uh, clients as priorities for the uh, master lease units. Um, but yeah, if Blas wants to elaborate on how that is going in practice. Yeah, I, I apologize. I just realized I forgot to introduce myself earlier. Nathaniel Regal, Deputy Chief Program <laughs> Officer. Uh, so uh, that is not the sole intended purpose of the master leasing. We absolutely see this as a tool for uh, encampment resolution activities, uh, both within the city and, and within uh, in the county. Um, in the initial buildings that we brought online, uh, they are in proximity to uh, some of the early uh, inside safe operations. Uh, we are also utilizing um, the encampment resolution funds from the state that LASA uh, received for the 110 corridor uh, to in combination with the HF dollars for uh, to specifically uh, be able to move folks from that, that area into master lease units uh, that expand, expands the longevity of the HF dollars because we're able to use um, state dollars for the first two years of, uh, of those master lease projects, which will then be um, uh, backfilled by HF dollars. Uh, and there is an overlap between the encampment resolution uh, boundaries for the state grant and some of the early inside safe. So there is, uh, there is a tie-in, but it is not exclusively intended for um, encampment resolution efforts. We see it as a tool both for um, increasing flow through interim housing sites as well as uh, for a, a tool for encampment resolution efforts. All right, and are there other costs for LASA, LASA's master leasing pilot that are going to be needed to fund it, be funded with local sources? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you over the What, what are outside. the other costs besides the, you know, for master leasing that we're going to have to use other money for, other local money? So, um, the, as, as Thomas uh, detailed, and, and I, I'll hand it back to him for additional comments, uh, the, uh, the operational costs are covered through uh, Measure H and the HF dollars from uh, LA Care and HealthNet. Um, and I just want to take a quick moment to just a gigantic thank you to those two organizations for uh, providing this funding. But um, Sorry, it, it, Nathaniel, I'm having trouble hearing you again. If you could just repeat the last two sentences and bring the mic closer to you. I apologize. I'm trying to look at you all while keeping yeah. my fi face yeah. in front of the microphone. I'm just listening. You don't have to look. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, to specifically call out LA Care and HealthNet and, and thank those two organizations for putting the HF money uh, into this, um, this project. Without, without it, we would not, without their seed money, we would not be where we are with this, uh, with this project. Uh, in terms of the use of local dollars, um, where at this point, uh, Thomas might be able to speak, speak more specifically, at least for the two buildings that we are engaged with for uh, encampment resolution work, um, those funds are all coming through the state grant. Um, other individuals who've been moved into other properties may be using um, TLS dollars from the city, um, but I, I don't know if you have the specifics, Thomas. Yeah, um, part of the strategy of the master leasing effort is actually to efficiently use existing uh, grant revenue sources, so existing funding sources that have traditionally been underspent and underutilized. Um, we're actually taking a look at what we have and best using and conduiting through master leasing, whether it's services, whether it's eligibility for the operational expenses, whether it's to cover gap rents, um, security costs, things of that nature. And so it's, it's a strategy for us to also not just move folks into units um, quite quickly, but to use what we have efficiently um, and, and fully use it, um, which I know has been just notorious issue that we've been confronted with. Um, 
if there is any room for additional local sources to further expand um, the project, uh, we do and we are exploring other um, service, um, I would say layering of, to, to really kind of ensure the sustainability of tenants, whether that's mental health services, um, um, health services, security services, just to really ensure the sustainability of the sites, and that's what we're currently um, exploring at the moment. What I was trying right to now. drill down on what as, what is the city going to have to be the backstop for? What are the other costs that the city is going to have to cover? Gotcha. Um, and where do you know? Are there particular funding sources that you're looking at? Now, all the all the other great stuff when it's OPM is great, but I'm worried about. Us. Yes. Yeah, and and we've had to really um, explore that same. Um, um, consideration with the county and it's with it's 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 tied with the liabilities of master leasing um, and that's those are the liabilities associated with any type of property um, management or ownership um, it's the maintenance of this of the physical plant of the building um, and anything that's tied to um, that is beyond the insurances um, essentially that would cover sorry just, can I just wasn't that what you said was covered by the HIP dollars? Yes, clar clarifying that that is what's covered by the HIP dollars. The uh, where city dollars would be used would be utilized uh, for rental assistance uh, for individuals who are moving in through time limited subsidies. So we're not we're not the city is not paying agreeing for the liability. So, so yeah. Like, so just to further clarify, the HIP dollars are going to take care of everything that. Um, that's within the eligibility of the funding agreement that's coming from the, from the managed care plans there are there is the potential of situations that are going to go beyond those costs and those are the liabilities that we would then look towards insurances to cover um, and then if there are any exceeding liabilities that go beyond the insurances that's where we are looking to, um, for the county to essentially financially back those liabilities um, so we're layering all of um, the various funding revenues to cover these costs, to cover the revenue, uh, the liabilities, and knowing that um, there are things that we cannot predict or foresee when it comes to operating properties. That is that unknown, um, which doesn't typically um, is extrapolated or, or outlined specifically within funding agreements. We would have to rely on the county and had to discuss that with the county to essentially financially back. In the same vein and venue, we would have to also consider that with the city um, if it were to essentially pull from local sources for, 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 these, for the master leasing. I, I'm sorry, I, I bet I'm confused by that. The, you're saying it would be the county and the city or the city? At first I thought you were saying it's going to be the county, and then you're saying but the same vein it would be the city. Yeah, so for the existing projects that are underway, uh, we have agreements in place with the county. If the city is looking to do additional projects uh, to sign on as a backer for specific master leasing projects, we would be looking to the city to, to backstop those potential liabilities. As Thomas explained, we are layering multiple funding sources, <coughs> excuse me, layering multiple uh, funding sources at the front end and would just be looking at. I guess it's, I hear what you're saying. It, it's, we need to be able to make informed choices on this stuff. and need to know what our what our costs are what our liabilities are and with this new master leasing arrangement i understand so you're saying on this the county project obviously it's them and on the city projects obviously <coughs> it's us so i'm assuming that like ula would be a backstop i mean wh where would we be getting the money for that that's potentially a lot of money that we need to know get our arms around well the qu i have a question is it potentially a lot of money like what is the order of magnitude for county backstop for these dollars i'm i'm, I'm not i can't really wrap my brain around what that means is that just so an insurance policy that the county's paying that isn't covered by these other funds so it's anything that goes beyond the insurance policies and losses on insurances for so general liability um, we don't have a clear sense of what those costs are and it's I, and I, that's, this is the same, I would say, circumstance and issue that traditionally our nonprofit agencies had to take on um, is that mystery and that unknown. And they would do so with, um, you know, entering into these master lease agreements, but assuming the full gamut of those liabilities, which could potentially put them under. That is the rationale and reason why we went towards a government backed master leasing program um, where we can really kind of cover those, those costs. That, oh, that, that, that actually, that actually oh. makes me nervous more than yeah. 
uh, that what you just what you just said is that it, dri it drives them under. Uh, so we're going to do it as a government because we have enough money not to go under, uh, which is a good concern. So I'd like to add an amendment to instruct the CLA CAO to report back on backstop costs that the city may be required to cover to pilot any master lease program. For item seven. For item seven. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Just, I, I want to get, uh, we need we need to know these things. Well, it, can, can we get that before we push this to the full council? Rather than, I mean, would that, would it be possible to get the information that you already have from your county run pilot sites back to this committee the next time we're meeting so that we can make an informed decision before we push it up to the full council? To me, that would make more sense. Um, so I would like to add that we did talk to the county about this and the county is not front funding any, they are not putting aside any like amount for the backstopping. They took on this risk with the knowledge that in the future if like, for example, a lawsuit were to happen, like the county would be the financial backstop for scenarios like that. And I believe they have well, I'm not 100% certain, but they have not set aside an amount. So we, at this point in time, we do not know what that amount would be. And in the report, we have a recommendation to um, ask city attorney and CEO's risk, man, uh, risk um, assessment uh, okay. team to consider all of that while creating a program for the city. So we, Get, okay, you're right, we do not know at this time. And okay. since the program has not been developed for the city specifically, we do not have all of that information. Okay, I mean, so I think we can move this forward as amended then. You could, I would just, add, sorry, I would, I would just add, there are certain items that are gonna be inherent. What, how, that sh how they've structured it and how it's layered is to deal with lessons learned, particularly from the service providers who were, uh, who first, you know, chartered out in this territory and then bringing in the HIP dollars to cover certain items that make this thing actually work probable. So as, as Thomas is, is trying to share is that there are things that go further out beyond the risk layering that was taken, taken, taken into consideration that he can't go. But I think it's easy enough to come back also and just share with you we, we deal with, hey, why is it they don't have to front fund costs? Because we're going to use project-based vouchers. If you want to speed it up and use time-limited subsidy, that's where you're going to spend some money. If there's some damages that aren't covered by the HIP money or you try to expand beyond those dollars, that's where you might end up covering. So all those things, all those components are there. It's just getting them so that you can hear them and see them. Okay. So fair it's, enough. If I may, it's, it's essentially the risk that the city is taking with any master leasing uh, project, whether it's the, the grand or the maker or others. Got it. Uh, that is uh, f liabilities that go beyond insurance or other things that um, are, you know, those that are unforeseen or unforeseeable. Uh, it, the, the significant difference uh, between the short-term leases for motels and this is the, the length of the contract. Yeah. It is a five-year agreement. But it, it's also why we wanted to make sure that however the program is structured, there were, there were um, confirmations that the property owners and LASA and the county, everybody had their, um, their proof of their either their insurance or their acceptance of liabilities on their end to the full extent possible before it comes to the city. So we were pr protected in the stack as much as possible. ULA money could be used this for this? Uh, we would have to look at that, but um, part of the question is what element of the, of the master leasing program we're putting our funding into. We're already funding um, TLS programs, for example. So if we're, we're funding more TLS, then we already have those kinds of components in place. And so it's a question of what, again, what source of funds would, would go into that if we wanted to. it. If we were funding the actual master leasing component of the property management, that would be a different question. Um, our instruction does request that the CAO identify the source of funds because we had not identified a source of funds yet. And the other question that goes along with that is the scale that, that we would be building into. So the program with HIP and the county that LASA has developed has a certain scale to it. If we want to double that or triple that, 
then that's a question of how much additional funding is needed and in what parts of the program we need to do. So there were these questions of what is the scale we're going to and what would the sources of funding be needed to fill in that scale. But so our, in, our initial report here is to recommend that this is worth pursuing and moving forward with and answering these final questions. Okay, great. Any other questions? No. Okay. So let's move item seven forward as amended. Uh, Mr. Verano, if you can call the roll. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Okay. Councilmember Lee. Absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Great. And we will hold item 13 until we have the second part of this report um, and move on to let's do the quick questions on items one and. Six. Uh, so item that, one is the RFP for ULA. If you want to read that into the record. Uh, to confirm, Madam Chair, you'd like to hold item, um, item 13, 13 to yeah. continue? To continue to our next meeting? Continued, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then for the record, item number one is motion Raman Hernandez relative to a proposed request for proposals to solicit qualified legal service providers to provide legal representation services for the United to House LA protections from tenant harassment program and uh, for the record madam chair uh, we're striking out anti from the tenant harassment program and item number six is a city administrative officer report relative to the city's immediate and long-term role in the community assistance recovery and empowerment care court program okay let's start with item one okay Mr. Uh, Bloomfield, uh, if you had a question go just ahead. jump in I mean yeah on item one, usually we have the RFP before we approve it, so this feels a little backwards that we don't have the RFP in front of us. Uh, but so I wanted to understand a little bit more about, you know, what is the scope? Um, how are we targeting folks? Is it AMI? Is it zip codes? Uh, how do they pick the clients? Uh, has the RFP been reviewed by the city attorney? Just give us a little bit more about what this looks like, because I don't really have a lot of info to go on other than what we're asking for. Certainly, Councilmember. Um, uh, Greg Good, Director of Strategic Engagement and Policy for the LA Housing Department. Um, thanks for the questions. Um, I think it would be probably valuable to just step back a little for context. Um, initially, for this program, we had uh, intended uh, to uh, work with LAFLA as our existing contractor on the eviction defense program to subcontract with other legal service providers to address to pursue potential civil litigation and in, in, in actions by tenants who are exercising their right under Tahoe to, uh, uh, to take private uh, course of action. Um, uh, when that report came through, uh, it became clear that uh, uh, our other contractor was not in a position necessarily to, they, they weren't ready to do that just from a capacity standpoint, as you know. LAF was taken on a lot with uh, ULA and with the eviction defense program and stay housed LA. So, um, hence we, we uh, worked with uh, the council to, you know, pursue an RFP to do it ourselves. Um, typically speaking, uh, LHD does, we, we don't bring RFPs in advance uh, uh, when it's re regarding services, um, lead, con lead abatement contractors, consultants that we contract with on prevailing wage compliance. Those we bring to the council when they've been awarded um, with rationale and explanation for how we got there and with contracts. The, the RFPs that we bring are typically just on housing projects, NOFAs for example. So this is actually consistent with pattern and practice in terms of how we do RFPs. Um, the, the objectives and the, and, and the goal is to actually provide an outlet for uh, uh, folks who will essentially presumptively self-select by reaching out. They will be, you know, they will be made aware of their opportunities by virtue of the tenant outreach and education program through ULA. Um, but they would go to, through um, uh, and reach out to, to these folks. Uh, and, and presumptively the contractor, and this could be part of, of, the, uh, of the RFP, they would do outreach as well um, to invite folks to come to them. The RFP is not done. We are going to be developing the RFP. Um, and again, consistent with how we typically do, we would come to y'all um, with an award uh, and, and contract and justification thereof. 
So how, how are those decisions going to be made in terms of who's targeted? I mean, it's a limited pool. Um, and how we're, how we're going about doing I mean, Really important stuff. I'm, uh, yeah. Asking the questions is not diminishing the importance of this at all. It's trying to understand how it's, how it's going to work. And if we're approving this RFP, are we, are we setting the guidelines uh, for how this is going? And if so, what are those guidelines? Well, I think that it would be, there's a couple of things. One, the RFP itself would just be to contract with legal service providers to actually provide the services, not necessarily. I mean, they may be doing some of the outreach. They may do some of the targeting, but they're going to just provide the legal services. Um, this would happen concurrent with um, the other elements of the target or the, the Tahoe program. Recall that um, by, uh, by law under ULA, 30% um, of the funds in the anti tenant harassment program are required to go to CBOs to do outreach, to provide know your rights education, to do navigation services um, in uh, uh, communities that are uh, vulnerable to displacement. Um, and that would be, this would be part of the suite of information that would be shared with tenants um, who find themselves in, in, in those positions, um, presumptively. And then I think that this would become part of the, 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 the sort of lexicon of opportunities for, for tenants at risk um, uh, in terms of understanding what their tools are and the, what, the, what, the service, what, the, what the city provides. Um, I think targeting would, again, be just around communities where there is a vulnerability to displacement. Um, we're working with SAGE and others um, towards you know, the, an anti-displacement tool to, to help identify those folks, and that would be some of the logical targeting. I guess I, I think this council should be weighing in on those things. Uh, it's a limited dollars. We're, 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 we're hiring someone to do this work, um, you know, and I certainly want it to be equitable, and I want it to be based on need, and, and um, I want to understand that, so I'm, I'm not really comfortable with the sort of we're working with all these groups and it's going to just happen. Um, so I don't know how to get it back to us so that we can help shape that as a policy-making body. Well, I think that the this RFP specifically, again, is is specific to the contractors that would provide the services. In terms of how that outreach happens, it's actually another part of the anti-tenant harassment uh, program. Again, that. There's, there's a number of, of CBOs that would be contracted with that are already subcontracted with uh, LAFLA under the eviction defense um, and, uh, and prevention program. And we've worked, the city's worked with them, and LAFLA's worked with them for, for, for years. That would be that path. I, we, we certainly can. I mean, what, you know, obviously it's the, the prerogative of the council. Um, I think it is important to note that you know, if the RFP specifically for the contract of legal services needs to come back through council, that's going to be, you know, any procurement process is going to take six-ish months, and then if we add that process, it's going to be another two to three months, and I just want to flag that, because that's right. Obviously, real. you know, I don't want to slow anything down. That's the last thing I want to do, but I do, I do want to preserve our, our, our role as a council, and I do feel like some of the stuff gets away from us, and then we hear about it later, and we're in the course correction mode, and I'd rather be in the front mode. So I, I'll let it go at the moment, but I, just, I guess I'm just putting a flag there that I, I don't feel like it's developed. I, I don't understand it enough in terms of what this, what we're really asking people for, and I know it's to get the right contractors out there, and there's, there's a handful of them that are great, and they're going to apply, but we have, you know, what are we actually asking them to do is not entirely clear to me, but I'll leave it at that. Well, and uh, I apologize if I'm not being clear. I mean, what we'd be asking them to do is is act as lawyers for folks exercising their private right of action um, in civil litigation against tenants or against landlords who they believe have been committing anti-tenant harassment. Well, I get that. I yeah. mean, that, that's the big picture. And then, right. and then within that, we have to make a lot of choices because they, they're going to, there's a limited pool of money. It's a, it's a, it's a great bigger pool of money because of ULA, thank goodness, and knock on wood. It, but it's still limited, so we're going to have to make choices in terms of how that gets targeted and, and what, you know, what is, what is the scope of, wh of what they're going to be suing for and, and all the rest. And I assume city attorneys already looked at this as well for form and legality because there's, 
there's a bunch of sticky legal issues. Too. We're still, I mean, we haven't drafted the RFP yet. This okay. is just giving us the authority to draft and, 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 and release the RFP. Okay. So right. yes, they would, they would, and it's in the instructions that this, that right. it would be subject to the city attorney for form and legality, for okay. sure. Great, thank you. Okay, great, so let's uh, call the roll on item one. Council Member Rahman. Yes. Council Member Bloomingfield. Aye. Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Rodriguez. Aye. Council Member Lee, absent, four ayes, and this item is approved. Okay, Thank you. let's move on to the question on item six. And this, this will be, I think, quicker too. <laughs> Sorry about the last. As you're coming up, my question on six, love the care court. How do we get people in, you know, there's a lot of expl explanation about how folks can end up here if they're referred by family members, but as a, as a council, as a city, um, we deal with a lot of people who could use this care court. How do we get people referred into this care court? Good afternoon, Councilman. How do we as a... Either a council office, a city, I, there, there's, I, I go, go through this and I yeah. see the, a lot of explanations of how family members and others utilize this, right. but we as a city should be able to refer people or as a council officer, as a service provider, should be able to, when we come across folks who are in desperate need of this, how, right. do, we, how do we get that process going? So we, the service providers would have the ability to because they would be the most likely to have an established relationship with the individual. Go, uh, go ahead and bring that mic a little closer oh, to you. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. And just for the record, Ben Buchanan with the office of the CAO, sorry. Uh, as far as how that process is initiated, a petition is filed with the court and the court will make a, a determination if the individual is in fact eligible for, for this, for the care, court, care plan. As far as if you don't really have a relationship with the, the individual, there really is no mechanism to refer people en masse or someone that you well, don't Not en masse, but I mean people in our, in our tiny home community or in, in where we're working with folks or, or as we're doing outreach and either our outreach workers or the city or LASA comes across someone who they've come across 10 different times who's clearly in desperate need. So in that in, scenario, it would most likely be the, the service provider. In, in the tiny homes, specifically the nonprofits can do it that are running it, right? Yes. It says so that in it, housing it, facilities. It wouldn't be any staff member. It would be the director of that, um, that particular organization. So when you take a look at the when you take a look at the plan, key key individuals and organizations such as service providers or others can uh, have people brought into this program. So when you ask how could we do it, if it's in one of the tiny homes and this is where you're experiencing it, or even if it's an outreach team that's out there who identifies somebody, both would have the ability um, to bring about the court uh, the care court um, action. So as a, as in addition to the new expanded, such as family members and other uh, groups. Okay, great. Uh, and as long as you're here, I might as well ask this other question. Uh, what exactly does it mean to have unaddressed severe and persistent psychiatric disabilities? Like what is the proof? Unaddressed means they are not engaged in voluntary psychiatric services. Yeah, right, but I guess my question is, for when you're doing the normal processes of 5150 holds or conservatorships, you have to meet certain proof thresholds that you work with either law enforcement or with mental health clinicians in order to make those evaluations. Right. So what so is the evaluation standard? for having a severe and persistent unaddressed psychiatric disability. So that determination will be made by a medical professional and they'll determine if the person is gravely disabled, unable to care for themselves, and they have a severe and persistent mental illness. Within really only um, schizophrenics and other psychotic disorders. So this isn't just for anyone with a mental health diagnosis. But that is determined on an individual case-by-case -case basis. And that, will, that determination will be made in the courts? Yes, but by a medical professional. So a medical professional will come to the court yes. after a civil case is initiated, examine the patient, or examine the individual who's being brought in, and then make a determination to the judge? Yes. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions? Great, let's move on. Uh, if you could call the roll on this item. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee, absent, four items, and this item is approved. Okay, let's uh, start with item eight. If you could read that into the record. Item number eight is a municipal facilities committee report relative to the rehabilitation and operations cost of the Mayfair Hotel project located at 1256 West 7th Street in Council District 1. Okay, and uh, we have people from GSD, BOE, and the mayor's office here. Is that right? Please join us. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Deborah Weintraub. I'm the chief deputy. I'm the chief deputy city engineer for the Bureau of Engineering. Um, this is a joint report with GSD. Melody McCormick, assistant general manager of GSD, is here to answer some of the questions. I will just move through the items on the report. Um, and the first one is what the question was the cost and length of time to build out facilities needed to provide services to Mayfair residents, including kitchen and dining areas, laundry facilities, and areas for social services. Um, we took the possession of the building uh, the end of August, September 1, we started the renovation process, so we're about five months in, and we're doing renovations and tenant improvements to bring uh, residents into the building simultaneously as we're doing permitting. And so I just want to note that it's, it's kind of record time to do both permitting and work on site. And we're only able to accomplish this because we've worked very collaboratively with GSD and their construction forces are doing the work for us. And we have a full-time project manager who practically lives at the site. The current, so we've divided this work into two phases. The first phase, which is the initial move in, our phase is 0, 1A, and 1B, and our current estimate for move-in is 7.75 million. Um, of that work, um, the phase 0 was a demolition. Phase, phase 1A was uh, initial work in the rooms, and 1B is additional work in the public areas. Um, our goal is to complete this construction work, we hope, approximately by April 15th. Our current challenge now is some initial seismic work that we have to do in the stairwells, um, and that's because the stairwell walls are hollow clay tile, um, and we're working with GSD to try to see if we could uh, bring on additional resources to do that. We have to reinforce the walls in the stairwells. Um, phase two work, which will happen after occupancy, includes seismic upgrades to what we call soft story, or the first three floors of the building, the elevator repair, some facade work, some, some roof work. That will happen after occupancy. And we anticipate approximately 10 to 12 month design period. We will seismically model the entire building, uh, the, all 15 floors, um, in order to do construction drawings just for the first three floors. The next question um, that council asked is about bringing uh, the Mayfair Hotel into full compliance with the current ADA standards, including elevators, common areas, uh, common bathrooms, kitchens, and individual rooms. When we purchased the building, it was fully ADA compliant. It had a CFO from the Department of Building Safety. But we had not had the opportunity to work with a provider to fully define the scope of work um, that they needed in order to effectively operate the building. So there has been changes in scope that have required us to do some ADA upgrades. The changes in scope, uh, the biggest one, the biggest uh, change was that the operator preferred that all the carpets in the hallways and the rooms be removed because they had a concern about uh, infestation in the carpet. So that, that changed the thresholds at all the doors and we had to float the hallways, I'm speaking construction terms, in order to put new vinyl tile flooring down. And we've also put new vinyl tile flooring down um, in the bedrooms. 
Um, we have brought in our own CASP professional or uh, ADA professional to relook at the um, building because we had changed the conditions by removing the carpeting and we're working very closely with our uh, consulting architects to do as many of the ADA compliance items that we can do now. Um, the next question had to do with external improvements, which is uh, really a GSD question, um, or it's a, it was a report that, uh, I'll just defer to you for GSD. Yeah, Thank you. Good that. afternoon. Right. So this next item was a request to look at the cost of external improvements uh, for lighting and cameras and security because obviously we want to be a good neighbor uh, to nearby residents and businesses. So as noted in the report, um, there is no plan under the existing operations or renovation budget to, to uh, install additional lighting and cameras on the exterior. The hotel already has um, an exterior lighting as well as a security camera system. Uh, it covers the front and both sides of the hotel and the south side, for those who've not been there, abuts against a neighboring structure. There's like a five inch gap. Um, there's two cameras on the west side, four on the front, and there's also four on the east side. Um, one of the, the cameras is damaged and we'll have that replaced. Um, both GSD and HACLA have um, inspected this. We have discussed that we will continue to evaluate the need for additional cameras or lighting on site as part of the existing maintenance budget if needed. Uh, the committee also requested um, a street lighting improvement plan. So I know the Bureau of Street Lighting has created one. Uh, they submitted it in a report. Um, for the area within a thousand foot radius of the Mayfair. Um, it's at a cost of $3.7 million. And I noted that as of December 5th, that item has been, that report has been referred to Budget and Finance Committee for review. Um, and I would <coughs> defer any questions on that street lighting improvement district to street lighting. Um, so HACLA, as part of the facility operations budget, has retained security staff. They will monitor the exterior of the building. Um, as well as the hotel, and that will occur 24 hours a day under the existing budget. Are there any questions on that section? I'll just move on to um, item D, and that is the annual cost of ensuring that the Mayfair Hotel is kept in a state of good repair. So um, as identified in the budget, that's within the report, the annual cost of operating and maintaining the facility has really not changed since the original report we presented in July of 2023 stands a little bit over $5 million annually. Um, there were some slight adjustments made within the existing budget, primarily to add the insurance costs uh, provided by HACLA that were requested by the city council during that hearing process. Um, some other line items were adjusted and there's a slight difference of $200, but clearly we're gonna absorb that. Um, this budget does include an annual replacement reserve of $1.5 million for major capital repairs, and that's going to be tied to a five-year capital plan similar to what we do for our city facility portfolio. Um, HACLA has hired a property manager, um, and they are onboarding a building engineer and staff, and we're going to be working with them at GSD, um, taking account the work that's completed by BOE um, as part of the renovations. The recommendations that were made initially by CBRE and the consultants when we were exploring the purchase of the hotel, and we are going to develop a five-year capital plan. Those capital funds will remain within GSD's budget. Um, for their operational needs, HACLA is going to continue to draw down quarterly to pay for utilities, custodial, security, repairs, etc. Um, and they provide us with a monthly report on all of those activities. And that's it for that section. Um, so item, item E was cost of providing parking for residents or staff. Um, there is an existing parking structure. What we are doing is adding storage for 60 bicycles in the existing parking structure. Item F was the time and cost needed for seismic work, including rooms and other facilities. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the current seismic work we're doing is we are reinforcing the hollow clay tile walls that um, encircle the uh, required exits, the stairwells. The remaining seismic work will be after the building is occupied, and that has to do with reinforcing the first three floors or the soft stories. Um, the next item was revised maintenance and hotel facility operation budget. Okay. 
So as discussed in the earlier section of the report, um, we have a summary here. Um, again, it's really not changed since the original report. There's a more detailed operations budget that's included in the back. Uh, and um, this is an annual cost. At this point, we don't anticipate there being any increases to it. I think that once we have a full year of operation with um, occupants in the hotel, we'll be able to come back to um, the CAO and the mayor's office and council and um, reevaluate what that is. Um, and um, we're going to be working very closely with HACLA on this budget and how it's implemented. Then we have a long section of the report that describes more um, in, in longer sentences of work we're doing. I will say that we meet weekly. We're on meeting number 22 with um, all of the city departments and, and the council office to talk through the changes that have been requested or the decisions that were made, such as removing the carpet. Um, and we're trying to be very um, cost um, conscious in making the building operational. At this point, our budget for phases zero and one is approximately $48 a square foot, which is, if you've done work in your own home, um, is a pretty low number. Um, the other work we're doing to make the building comfortable for the residents is uh, all the uh, rooms are being painted, the hallways where we need to paint the ceilings, we're painting the ceilings. For the operations area, the hotel had kind of moody, dark walls. They're all being painted white. We've worked very close with Weingart to uh, create um, the medical spaces, the intake area, and um, the area where uh, there will be counseling for the residents. And then the, the report uh, breaks down our estimated cost to move in, 7.75. The estimated cost for phase two which is 18.5, is not a number that we um, really have a deep analysis of yet. We will start that process now. We've been working really towards move-in to get folks into the building. Um, we are carrying a contingency, and we indicate a shortfall based on our estimated cost of about $8.9 million. Uh, the last item was a server pro service provider update. No. Um, good afternoon, council members. My name is Mia Jackson. I'm the senior director of interim housing solutions in the mayor's office. Um, there are two points of clarification uh, that I want to make before we move forward. We mentioned the $60 million ERF grant funding that the county um, was awarded in collaboration with the city. I just want to clarify that that entire $60 million is not allocated solely to the Mayfair. It's spread across several projects. Um, the annual cost for the base services that the city will be responsible for is at about $11.9 million. That's it for the service. 11.9. Yes. And that is not covered by the? There's two separate contracts. So there is the city contract for services, which covers the program and case management staff. It covers the data coordinator, their activities coordinator, um, activities and food for the clients. And then under the encampment resolution fund, those cover the medical costs. So for the nurses, the nurse practitioner, mental health therapists, substance use disorder counselors, transportation for the clients, and then both contracts cover like administrative and other programming costs. Is that your full report? Yes, unless there are yes. questions. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming in today and for all the work that you've been doing. It's very clear that um, there has been a significant amount of coordination to move this forward on, on time and uh, to ensure that the second date that we set for people to be able to move in would be met. Um, so that's great. Uh, if we could talk about the services dollars for a couple of minutes first, I think that might be useful for me. Um, and then I can open it up for questions. Uh, if I imagine that there may be a number of questions, I might ask that we all ask two questions and then seed and then go back around, um, just so that uh, we all have time to hear from each other. And Councilmember Harris Dawson, I know you have to leave if you have any initial questions. I, I can also seed to you first. Okay. 
Um, so just on the services dollars, that 11.9 million um, for the services, where is that money coming from? Where's that plan to be coming from right now? The plan is to use inside safe dollars to cover that. So why is it that, so we have a settlement with the Alliance um, that you know, we're, we've been talking about in this committee for months. Part of the reason why I think every single member of this committee has felt urgency around that settlement agreement is that the county, through that settlement, will pay for services at our interim sites. We provide the beds, they provide the services. Can you talk a little bit more, and that's till 2027. So this is a good time to not pay for services from our own funding to actually, and this is part, the, these beds will be counted towards our, our settlement goals. Um, so why is it that we are using a separate pot of funds to pay for these services to be very honest with you, it, it does not make any sense to me to, to do that. Um, and I'm just curious uh, the rationale behind it. Well, for the first two years, this program is being operated as encampment resolution. So it's very specific to the residents or people that were experiencing homelessness in the Skid Row area. And so because it's that specific source of programming, the encampment resolution grant is the county's contribution to the services and as we discussed previously in council through the approval this is only the first two years of the site and I think there will be a need in collaboration with all of our city partners CAO and council of course to talk about what the programming will be after these two years of the encampment resolution which will include the opportunity to go to the county and um, use that service provision directly from them but Again, what is the county's contribution to this from the encampment resolution? I, I'm not following. Well, that was, it's the funding that they were awarded that's going specifically towards this project. But the then why is it coming out of our inside safe allocation? There's two. So there's the base contract. They won't, they can't cover the base and the enhanced services. They're covering enhanced services, but the base, which we had for the clients, keep in mind that these clients are currently housed at the LA Grand under Inside Safe using Inside Safe dollars and those same clients will be transferred over to the Mayfair for services. Right. So but the hope as we've been talking again, we've been talking through this for a long time and after this I will cede to my other colleagues, but part of the reason we have been so focused on the settlement here is because it gives us an opportunity to use the county's dollars for services while we pay for interim housing through, uh, you know, the physical spaces for it. And I guess I'm, j I'm still not, and maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but I'm still not following why that, the, these services cannot be provided by the county through the settlement agreement even if those health and medical services that are additionally being provided by the ERF are also there. Like what is the, what is, what is about this, what is there about these particular services that can't be provided through the agreement? Um, I'm Jenna Hornstock, Deputy Mayor of Housing. I, I think what we can say, council member, is we need to account for the budget. If you could just Sorry. bring the mic closer Sorry. to you, thank you. That's the ongoing And you don't have to today. look at me, you can just speak right into Sorry. that mic. Hello. Um, I, I think, I think the best answer to the question is we need to be accountable to, to say we have funding to cover the basic services that we committed to um, in the partnership with the county on the encampment resolution grant. So for now, what we committed to in that partnership with the county is to provide our inside safe services. They were providing the enhanced services. I hear what we hear what you're saying about the county. We're more than happy to follow up and see if there's a way to shift some of that cost to the Alliance lawsuit, but I don't think either of us can answer that question right now. We, we, we have the budget set aside, but we're happy to look at a way to, su to supplant the sign. funds if we can. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Mr. Uh, Harris Dawson, I know you have to leave. So thank Please you so ahead. much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Maybe I'll put this, I'm asking the same exact question. I'll just preface that I'm just, I want to say it another way. Uh, because it seems like two times you all answered on behalf of the county. And as, if I understand it correctly, none of you are the county, right? Correct. Right, so because we we're asking you why the county hasn't isn't paying for this because on its face 
we pay for beds, they pay for services, you all come in here and say we're paying for the beds, and oh, by the way, we're also paying this for yes. the services. Sounds way out of whack. So my question is, and I'm trying to get at the same piece of information, has the county been asked to pay this $11 million, and what did they say? That I know of? I, I don't know, so I will we'll have to get back to you. I so, don't, yeah, I don't know. The so I think this services. council would strongly encourage that you ask in a public way soon, uh, because I, 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 I understand and frankly agree with Look, we have human beings, they need services, you can't wait around. If they don't have their act together, you can't wait around for Mr. that. Mr. Harris Dawson, we all yes. agree with that. Huh? No, no, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, so I agree with that concept, but like, you know, there's this whole settlement that we've had a lot of angst around, you know, building beds and, you know, the, the mayor's office is running up to Sacramento and Washington to raise money for all this stuff to do our part. And then they just kind of go, well, we only have this much money, so deal with it. So I, I just, it would be, I think it would be helpful to me as a council member, and I think my colleagues share this, is that we place a demand on the county and at least make them answer in public that they're not going to follow the alliance lawsuit. At least make them answer that. Um, because I just, it, that, that's, it's very troubling to have something put in front of us that does the opposite of what the settlement says. Yes. That's it. Okay. I, I can okay. Back. Great. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Ms. Rodriguez. Well, first of all, uh, I want to know why uh, Lourdes isn't here because whenever I ask questions, and I know Jenna, you say you're not the you're not the one really talking about homelessness, but because it has fundamental questions related to. Uh, the relationship of alliance fulfillment and uh, inside safe conversation. There's there's a lot of overlap here. So when you say you know, and and I'm saying this because the the pattern is to not have the people who are capable of answering the questions and being held accountable to this council, and that's a really big problem. So I want to make sure that it's publicly noted that we need the people here to your point, Mr. Harris Dawson, even the people at the county, because what they're gonna do is they're gonna put measure H on the ballot and then still not give us any money and depend on our taxpayers and our voters to approve it. So there's a pattern here of denying the information that we're asking for repeatedly. So I'm just formally making that request going forward, Jenna, because you're always in the hot seat and you don't have all of the comprehensive uh, answers to some of the questions. So I just wanna make that statement. I, um, I appreciate that. Can I just clarify one thing? In terms of when we went through the Mayfair acquisition, I totally understand the question. I totally understand the question before us, and we're happy to follow up. Um, that is a new question around the Mayfair, so I think, because when we did the acquisition, and I sat for many hours with this council, we did talk about many times over Inside Safe was going to be the source of funding for the basic services with the enhanced services through the encampment resolution grant. So I want to be clear understanding the question before us and we're happy to get back to you but that is what we presented at council when we did the acquisition but it's also obligating future budgets and that's what we said about the problem uh it's inside safe is part of the 2023-24 fiscal year budget what you're saying is that inside safe is vetted approved and now committed in advance for the 24-25 fiscal year to cover these things. And that's not how we budget in this city. So I have a really big fundamental problem with that, for, first of all. Uh, secondly, um, because we, you know, when we talk about inside save, we're, let's just call it general fund dollars. Let's stop trying to pretend it's some magic pot of money that exists somewhere else. We're talking about general fund dollars. And so uh, I want to start with the first question. Uh, and, you know, Deborah and, you know, Melody, you can kind of help me understand in terms of the construction costs, because we're already projecting a deficit uh, in what the anticipated costs for renovations are. And so uh, when we, you know, th this is, again, this was, these were the issues that I raised, is that we were like, hurry up, we got to buy this thing. Yes, we paid out money to this owner uh, to make improvements. They didn't do the improvements, so now we're going to buy it as is and make those improvements. And oh, by the way, now we've got these seismic uh, 
expectations. Are the seismic improvements able to be completed while occupied? So, um, Council Member, we did uh, talk about the uh, when we came to Council to purchase the building, we had brought in a structural engineer who did a very preliminary assessment. The building's been around 100 years and yeah. it's actually done really well through all our various earthquakes. He did a very quick model and uh, his initial assessment was it's really in pretty good shape. But he recommended, and, and we mentioned this um, at the time of acquisition, that we address the soft story. He didn't, and we didn't think it needed to happen before our occupancy. And the answer is yes, we believe that work can be done after the building is occupied, which means we're going to have to cordon off some areas uh, to keep residents out, and we may for a period of time have to take people out of some rooms on the third floor. But to do that work before occupancy would have taken a year or more. So it was, we didn't, we decided to do it after occupancy and we feel we can do it after occupancy. If and this, are these yeah. seismic retrofits, they're recommended or mandatory? They're not Optional. mandatory. There's nothing mandatory to be upgraded in the building. It's actually, uh, it's steel frame encased in concrete. Um, so there's no building and safety mandatory requirements. These are, recommended as a prudent building owner. And we're, and again, but we're already looking at building in a projected deficit and being able to, to do some of these improvements. And so, you know, I'm just, just kind of considering all the costs uh, anticipated as well as what is being obligated to future budgets for services that are not getting covered by the county, which should be covered by the county. Um, we're continuing to create larger expectations, uh, potentially out, you know, we've already uh, redacted CDBG funds. We've already, you know, we've pulled from all these different sources, denying a lot of other programmatic obligations that we have to do this one project. And now we're committing more of our future general fund dollars uh, to provide services as well as deficit, you know, future deficit, anticipated deficits in the structural, uh, in the structural uh, would be nice but not mandatory improvements, right? I so I'm yeah. just I'm just trying to look. I'm just I, I got it for me. My job is just to make sure that uh, I ask these questions and put it all out on the table so that we're really clear on what we're committing ourselves to in the future because it is being committed for us. Um, just as the services are already anticipated in a future fiscal year without budget deliberations. That's already been assumed that we're just gonna do this. So, you know, I, I'm just, I, so the answer was yes. So I, pre, you know, the answer was yes and that it wasn't mandatory and that's that's what I wanted to get to. But I'll go ahead and pass it back. And I think there'll be opportunities to come back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Council Member Bloomfield, do you have questions? Yeah, no, and, and I, I mean, I appreciate the direction everybody's going here and share the same, the same questions. Um, maybe a couple of different uh, questions, uh, different topics. The, the Bureau of Street Lighting reports talked about the 3.7 million for lighting improvements in the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, does does the HEA budget account for this, or where where is that coming from? That's being handled through the Budget and Finance Committee. It's a the Bureau of Street Lighting. It's not within this team. So the 3.7 million for lighting improvements is not going to come out of the Inside Safe money. Not to our knowledge. Okay, so that's. Bob, didn't we give money? What's that? Didn't we give money to infrastructure? In yeah, the there was money for infrastructure. Eight million, right? I believe so. Okay, it could probably come out of that. Go ahead and go on mic, but you can ask, <laughs> you go ask the follow-up, go ahead. <laughs> but I mean, the mayor's office does have $8 million in infrastructure, right? That was allocated in the budget? For and wouldn't, this would qualify for infrastructure, would it not? Sure, I right. don't think so. I just, just thinking about the pots that are available. Yeah, and I'm just trying, I mean, I'm trying to understand where all the money for the different things are right. coming from. We talked about, uh, we, we had instructions to fund the clean team services for the neighborhoods. Is that funded by uh, HEA or where is that funded from? So those amendments were put forth um, by the council office as report backs. Uh, a source of funding has not been identified to our knowledge for that. Okay, what about the uh, small business assistance program for the surrounding communities? That has already been submitted through EWDD as well. It's not a um, mayor's office uh, report. 
Okay, so when, when do we expect that? You're saying that's... That one has been submitted to the council file. I don't know that it's been scheduled to go before any committees as of yet. Right. And is the scope of services with the wine guard the same as the $110 per bed for inside safe operations, or is it a different scope of services? The scope of services that we're um, is for. the same, yes. It's the same, and then there's the enhanced services... Correct. ...that county or, or should be paying for. Okay. Um... The elevators, have they been fixed and how many are going to be decommissioned? There are three uh, passenger elevators. <coughs> they have been fixed. They're all functioning. But the elevators are, a lot of the equipment is original. So our goal in phase two is to take one elevator out at a time and to uh, put in <coughs> new equipment. Really? <laughs> the mic. He's right into the mic. Okay. <laughs> I trying to turn away. Bless you. <laughs> okay. And then, then the, the additional cost, how much of that was from seismic and how much is, is other things? And I know that we never know as there's always increasing cost. But So the additional cost for this first move-in phase really came about because of additional scope that was defined after the city took possession of the building. And it's working closely with the um, operator with uh, and with the mayor's office and with the council office, we made decisions on a weekly basis about adding scope to make it a better a better facility. So it's not the seismic? That no, okay. it's not. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay. Um, I, I just had one, uh, one additional question related, back, going back to the question of the services. Um, you know, one of the ongoing challenges with uh, the bifurcation of the city's efforts around homelessness response, one bucket that has included Inside Safe and one bucket that has included all of the other efforts that are ongoing in the city, um, has been that the same questions that I think council offices are asking about our own interventions or new interventions that are coming up in our district um, are, have have not been uh, discussed through through inside uh, through the efforts that Inside Safe is um, making, and I guess this is just more of a, a just a philosophical question. I guess is is why couldn't these uh, services dollars be the same dollars that we're using for um, for for that the county is using to meet their obligations through the settlement. Like, is there a reason why this is being thought of as a different intervention? You know, to me, as someone who has been working in this city now for three years and over the last few months as the chair of this committee, this bifurcation has been challenging. I think we need to be thinking of this as one holistic system. Um, I think all of us wanted to make sure that the mayor's office, when you guys first started, were, were able to have the resources you needed to, to take action on homelessness um, in a urgent way. Uh, and I think we're very excited to partner with you on that. But it cannot be two different tracks. Um, I heard, for example, in the other, uh, in the report from LASA on the pilot projects, that inside safe hotels are being prioritized for being moved into the pilot locations for master leasing. It just feels so, as an unhoused person being in this city, it just feels so arbitrary, like what puts you on a track for housing or not. Like I just, that doesn't sit right with me. And we can't be building a system where we're all fighting to be at the front of the line we should all be in the same line and we should be building a better line together. You know, that's just, that has to be the goal of our work. Um, and so I think, I just want to understand philosophically why has there, is there a reason why this is thought of as a different track from every other piece of interim housing that the city is funding, uh, you know, over these next few years? Uh, why is it that services dollars have to come separately for this work? Why cannot it be the same level of service being offered at every interim site across the city that so, is so being paid for by the county. <laughs> so again, I, I think our office 
was anticipating questions about budget. This is a philosophical question. So well, no, this is a budgetary question. Okay. You know, it is a budgetary uh, question because the. It, I so it, I'll I'll do my best to say f first off, going back to why not county services. I think my response was if you could bring the happy, mic. We are happy to ask the question and see if we can find a way to supplant dollars. I think going forward, it's going to be an interim housing facility that will be compliant with the Alliance lawsuit and thus eligible. I think I would want to double check, but, but sitting here based on just about a year in our office, I would say part of the issue has been wanting a higher level of service care and standard. Right. Um, but and I know we, we've had our, our deputy mayor of, of homelessness and community health start this week, and that's going to be a huge focus and, and want to make sure. So Part of it could be wanting to test out and make sure that we have a higher standard of care, particularly um, looking at higher acuity populations that we're serving, particularly for these two years at the Mayfair. Uh, again, but, I just, yeah. as someone who really fights on behalf of our district and our unhoused residents in our district who are also very, very sick to get care, if we're putting in a level of service at one facility, that's what we should be putting in at every facility, and that's what we should be asking for from our partners at Agreed. the county. I, I think we agree. I, I think what I'm hearing is I think we agree we want to see a higher level of care and service, and that is going to be a focus moving forward, and that we want to work with the county on that, particularly if the ballot initiative is going to be moving forward on Measure H Part 2. Um, we are going to want to see the county committing to a, a higher and better level of care across the board um, for the dollars that we will have coming into the city. Okay. And just if you could speak to the issue of why this is considered a different branch of services, just because you wanted to provide higher care than what the settlement would provide? Like, why is this designated as something that the mayor's office wanted to fund separately? You mean the Mayfair? Mm -hmm. Again, we were, well, there's, there's two separate things. One is targeting having a permanent infrastructure for interim housing across the city. And the May, that was part of the budget going forward. We said we wanted to target at least 400 rooms of acquisition. And with this and the two Project Home Key 3 sites, we've actually got 480 underway in different parts of the city. So, so the target of the Mayfair was a broader trying to create this infrastructure going forward that will be subject to Alliance um, lawsuit or settlement um, obligations. But again, I think the services are more about trying to reach this higher standard of care. And, and this in particular now being wrapped in with the encampment resolution grant was really trying to, to test this model of something new. So I think the intention is to have this level of care for everybody across the city. I mean, that would be, that is the goal. Right, but yeah, I mean, it, again, it, we don't have those dollars of it. We, have, we are fighting over a very limited pot of funds and we don't have we don't have those dollars available to us. Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you, Ms. Rahman. And, you know, I don't even know what the definition is for higher level of care that is just kind of being thrown out there, to be honest. I'm not sure what the measure is, what the standard is, and how you're defining it. So it's just, it's words. Um, so initially, you know, and again, and this goes back to, I, I feel like what we need, I mean, literally is a picture, a graph that says, you know, it's going to cost this much to do this project. And, you know, because I, I love when it's broken up in pots that says, well, here's general funds, here's HEA. That's one and the same, but you guys define it differently. That's $25 million estimated of, of general fund dollars. Um, but it needs to basically almost be like a color block of what the sources of funds are. And then uh, along with the sources of fund for the services of where they're coming from. And I feel like every, because everyone's just mixing pots of money of where these, you know, for the services, for the, for the programmatic side, as well as for the construction side. I feel like it literally has to become that linear and transparent, like literally pictures, because it keeps getting delivered in multiple forms. And I, frankly have just become distrustful of the words that I hear because it's I, I'm just trying to always clean it up and align what has been reported previously to what gets reported uh, at the very next meeting whether it's between uh, I literally now have charts being made of who said what when and whether to compare notes and whether it aligns because it hasn't 
So um, with the encampment resolution grant, um, it was initially, you know, those dollars can't be supplanted for other, for previous expenditures. Um, but since we've discovered that the encampment resolution grant can't completely cover, that, that was the rationale behind why CD1, for example, couldn't use a portion of those rooms, as I recall, right? Was that the encampment resolution grant, per the former chief's uh, comments, made it ineligible for CD1 to have a certain m amount of rooms accessible for their use. Now that you're proposing all these general fund dollars, why couldn't that be made? That, why couldn't that be made available? I, I want to clarify. It it still is encampment resolution grant is paying a portion of the services for every person that comes in under the grant into the hotel, and we committed a certain number of rooms, and this is helping us meet that obligation. So our city obligation as part of that grant partnership is to cover the base what we're calling base services is the inside safe services that's the 11.9 million the encampment resolution grant is paying for the enhanced services um, and that is what we shared with council when we went through okay. that position so we're covering the base and then there is additional encampment what and what is the enhanced care the what and what is enhanced what care is what does that pay for and i get like literally and i'm not joking guys I need a picture because I want, to, I want a picture of a little person that so much of the services that they're going to receive is coming from the encampment resolution. How much is going to be covered? What does that enhanced service look like? Because I, I can't even understand how the sources are being split up to serve these individuals that are going to be placed into these units and what that means and whether or not it's consistent with any other facility we're providing services to across the spectrum because I don't care if you call it they're being serviced by inside safe whether they're being serviced by LASA it's all the same service providers it's all the same dynamics so we need to stop pretending that it's different it's not it's all the same there should be one standard and right, LASA's absolutely. involved and LASA's involved in all of them mm -hmm. so somehow this particular pot, though, is being managed and dri driven by the mayor's office. So it should be this innocuous kind of thing. We should know exactly what it is. So I literally, like, like this is a request now because it's no longer, uh, you know, explain it to me because the words just don't mean anything anymore. It's just literally I have to compare old notes to new notes uh, after these committee meetings to ascertain whether or not I'm being told the same thing, unfortunately. So I literally want to have like a color-coded source of what these dollars are gonna cover, what they're eligible to cover so that we can understand going forward. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess, I, I guess that's it. I literally, that's what, that's what I want going forward. Okay, great, Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, just, just one other thing. I'd love to get some information on. Um, you had a great document in the earlier thing about the amortization calculation, and it was a Mayfair cost-benefit analysis, and it compared the nightly rate, the monthly rate, the annual rate, and it compared it to the Grand Hotel. Uh, and I believe the post-acquisition cost was like $47 a night. Uh, so with all these changes, I'd love to see how, that's, how the, the chart changes and whether we're still banking a, a cost saving versus, versus the grand or whether it's uh, whether we've exceeded that or, or, or where we are I mean just just to kind of eyes wide open know where where we're at and I and I understand a lot of these things come up I'm not the, the chart we had was where it was sure. where it was and just so we have our eyes wide open of where where we are and where we're going no problem great thank you okay um, so I'm, is that something that we would need in, before we would be moving this forward? I'm sorry. No, 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 I, I, not to, this is just so we understand we're eyes wide open. I'd like to get that chart. We, it doesn't need to be, I don't, I'm not trying to hold it up. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I, there is a timely, a time sensitive, um, I imagine it's report, fairly right? easy for them to put that together too. It's just the it's just the calculating the new costs and putting yeah. it into the chart. So, ideally, maybe before it comes to full council. But 
Yeah, I think it would be useful if it could be added to the council file and then next time we are able to have this, I'm sure this will come back to, or something related to the Mayfair will come back to the committee at some point so we can. Um, Actually, I think this, this is coming to budget anyway. Oh, it is coming to budget? It's coming to budget. So okay, maybe, great. Maybe yeah, so maybe before it comes to yeah, budget, I think that would be useful. Okay. So um, this is going to another committee, and so I think we have the opportunity as it moves to the next committee to talk about some of the questions that have come up here. Um, I would love to speak with um, uh, speak with members from the mayor's office offline about the questions related to the county and to service quality across interim sites in the district. Um, I feel very, very strongly that we cannot have two ways of providing services um, to unhoused residents in the city. And, you know, it, I, I think we have to have a coordinated approach. Um, and we all have the same goals. I don't anticipate that getting to that coordinated approach will be challenging, but it, we just have to do the work. It's going to be a lot of work, and we just have to do it. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you. Um, and if there's no other questions, uh, I think, Mr. Verano, you can do we need, we need to call the roll on this? Uh, yes, it would yeah, be okay, for note ahead. and filing the, the report. It would be to note and file the report. Note and file, okay. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez. It's noting and filing, and then it'll come to budget. Fine. Councilmember Lee, absent. Three eyes, and this item is noted I and filed. I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> well, we'll I, I, I think you guys will have Okay, so we have two more items, um, and, but I think um, we've, we've talked about item 10 before, so I think we can, if we can uh, bring that one up here, we can move, fo move through it fairly quickly. Thank you to everyone who came. Item number 10 is a homeless strategy committee report relative to filling homeless engagement team vacancies, approving the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority scope of work for the housing slash system navigator position and related matters. Okay, so um, just for context, uh, you know, we have, what is this? we heard this in late December, uh, a draft of this report, is that right? December, yeah, we heard this in December. Um, and this, I, I believe the report also went to the Budget and Finance Committee. Is that right, Mr. Blumenfield? I believe so. Yeah, so we've, I think the p people who are here certainly have heard this twice already. Um, and so if you want to just explain to us at this moment what, what exactly we're being asked to do at this time and provide a three to four sentence summary of, of the change, which is what we discussed in the meeting prior. Um, I think that would be very helpful. So the three to four sentence summary of what we discussed and then what we're being asked to do today, I think that would be, that would be helpful for us. And if we have additional questions, we can hopefully move through them quickly. Pranita Mate from the office of CLA. So the council approved 2.3 million from the UB to continue LASA's HET for six, six more months through the end of the current fiscal year in December. And during that report, um, there was also a recommendation to fill the currently vacant head positions where appropriate with the newly defined system navigator positions. And at the December HSC meeting, HSC asked CLA and CAO to work with LASA to report back on the scope of work for the 10 vacant head positions that would be repurposed to become system navigators. And since this is a newly defined position that would be taking over for HET, the city wanted to work with LASA to set the scope of work for what exactly these positions will be doing. So the report in front of you uh, describes the, the scope of work for the system navigator positions and has an attachment from LASA for the job description. And the report also has um, additional recommendations for future reports to discuss in more detail the types of ha housing navigation work that currently exists in the city, how they're deployed, and how we can set benchmarks and performance metrics for that work. Um, 
and the job description for the head positions that will become system navigators, uh, like I said, is attached to the report, but to give a very brief description, these positions will assist uh, people experiencing homeless uh, to perform, will assist the people experiencing homeless to get connections to available resources, uh, such as medical care, health insurance, mental health and substance use support, benefits, uh, advocacy, it will, they will also be helping clients to develop a housing location plan and help with housing placement and retention. They will also conduct uh, CES assessments. They will also help clients with preparing housing assessments and referrals. Um, yeah, that's the report. Any, any other feedback from members? Um, so, you know, I think my, my approach to this continues to be the same, which is we, I understand that we need more people who can navigate um, people experiencing homelessness through the housing system. Uh, and we need that in order to start moving people out of interim housing and into permanent housing. We desperately need this. These are positions that have been left vacant in our overall outreach network for some time now. And um, so I am comfortable with making this change and I'm comfortable with moving this forward. I did just want to say on the record here is that I believe about four or five months ago our office had started requesting additional information about council office contracts for outreach. We've now made that request multiple times. We still have not received it. And as we move into a bu new budget cycle, looking at our entire system of outreach, trying to create a coordinated approach without duplication. I still don't have that information available to me, and I don't have any way of getting that. There's no amount of work I can do to get that besides to ask you for that. So I really did want to state on the record that it would be great if we could get that. I'm comfortable with moving this forward, but I need that information. This committee needs that information, and the Budget and Finance Committee needs that information before we're able to think about what our outreach system funding will look like for next year. So I just wanted to make that request to all of you today. Um, in the hopes that we can get that in a timely fashion. Okay, any questions from committee members on this? Go ahead, Ms. Yeah. Rodriguez. Uh, how many interim housing sites in the city are required to have navigation services in their contracts but currently lack navigators to fulfill the obligations? Um, at this time, we do not have the exact number, but with our discussion with LASA, we have um, talked about how many, multiple, city contracts for interim housing do include housing navigation and because this report had to come out in such a short amount of time we did include a recommendation to ask LASA to give us a full inventory of all of the housing contracts that do have housing navigation. LASA don't you have a, uh, a matrix that kind of tells you exactly like a, a simple chart that kind of tells you where it exists where the gaps are you don't have that readily available? We're, Nathaniel forgot can you hear me? Yeah, I, okay, I just speak a little louder. Just bring it, bring it right up to your yeah. <laughs> Trying not to swallow it. But. No, no, get <laughs> in there. Uh, so Nathaniel so Vergad, Deputy here. Chief Program Officer at LASA. Uh, we are uh, compiling that list right now. There, because the contracts have been uh, authorized at various times, and uh, we're working with the providers on exactly what staffing they have. So there are contractual issues uh, that we, contractual um, language that we have, we're working with the providers to ensure that we have clarity in terms of exactly what positions are funded, are, are uh, filled at the moment. There, um, as we discussed in, uh, in an, another agenda item around the interim housing uh, cost analysis, we've uh, heard from a number of providers that they are struggling to be even maintain their sites. Um, and we've heard from a couple of providers that um, part of the, the result of that is an inability to maintain staffing um, because the wages that they're paying are, are uh, not competitive with other uh, with other fields. We're seeing significant turnover across the homelessness sector. So we're compiling that and we'll bring that back to uh, the report from the CA. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think part of the problem is too is, you know, and to Ms. Raman talking about uh, even just the council or those that are hiring uh, outreach teams, we're basically competing against ourselves. We're driving up the costs on ourselves. I mean, that's, the duplication 
in all of these things, whether you're talking about Insight Safe standing it up or anybody else, we've already seen the service providers exploiting it for that reason. When you compete against yourself, it's the same pot, it's, it's kind of like LAPD's uh, looking for law enforcement hires. When we're competing against other agencies that are paying more, we're, we're throwing more money at it for the same pool of candidates. And when, whether it's a council office standing up an outreach team or navigators to help facilitate because we can't get clarity from LASA or all of the service providers, all we're doing is driving up the costs because we're competing against each other. Same is true with Inside Safe. So if we're not creating one succinct system that functions for everybody and, and it, it, you know, we're driving up our own costs. This is the homeless industrial complex. That so my exact. question, so my question is, do you have, and I'm gonna, I'm, again, literally I'm asking for charts because I'm, I'm losing my mind. I, I'm gonna need the mental health services soon. I don't know why I'm not already enrolled. Um, do you have a chart that has all the service providers that say where the, sh the staffing short gaps, uh, shortfalls are, uh, for the, and whether or not the navigation services are provided by site, where, where the, I mean, you don't just have that automated where you guys can look based on the service providers? Aren't they required uh, by contract to kind of inform you and keep you apprised? There's no methodology to have that readily available? We have the, the, the contracts because there's, uh, it's so dynamic in terms of the turnover. At any given moment, I can't give you an accurate picture. We're putting together a picture that will be a point in time uh, account for you uh, that we will uh, include in the report that was mentioned uh, by CLA. The, the whole point of the interim housing cost study is exactly that, to get us to uh, a, a joint, a single model that uh, would be applied city, county, LASA, all funders, uh, ideally having the same base model that would also allow for uh, any of those funders to add additional services, essentially choosing from a menu with, uh, with uh, a known cost associated with those, uh, with those services. So that we would be able to have uh, we would not have competition between city or county, loss of city or county, any of the above for, uh, for these services, that we will have a shared base model that uh, is actually based on actual cost of operation, not just uh, an estimated cost from four or five years ago. That is the, the point of that study and the work that we're doing both with CLA, CAO, county, um, and, and LASA. The metrics for the navigation services is uh, that something that you are planning on sharing with the council uh, before the budget is finalized? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Bloomingfield. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're getting closer to understanding, we're sorting out all the different outreach teams. If we're reassigning folks uh, and there's a, shor a shortage of outreach teams in terms of a particular area, how is that gonna be dealt with or, or when do we figure that out? As we're moving navigators out. So, uh, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Um, so the, the goal uh, in terms of the deployment of the housing, uh, the, the new navigator position, um, our goal is to be uh, making a quarterly deployment schedule for those based on prior quarters information about uh, flow through interim housing um, and so that we can target those, uh, those staff in where we're seeing the biggest um, bottlenecks within our system. Uh, in terms of the correlate question about where we're seeing gaps in outreach, um, that will be part of that plan. So we will have these, these are staff that will be able to be deployed either for outreach or navigation. And so if we're seeing gaps on either side, we can deploy them. The, uh, from what we've seen and, and, and also heard from this council uh, is that there, there are a lot of outreach teams uh, deployed across the city. There are more coming online through the Alliance Settlement through, um, through the Department of Health Services and the MD, uh, MDT contracts. Um, so as we layer in all of those, um, uh, if there are any gaps identified, we would come back to this council and request that a particular team be deployed as outreach uh, ongoing or for a specific, specified period um, and remove them from that navigation function. Uh, but the goal of this is to be able to have these staff that are well-trained in both uh, aspects of the work and so that we can deploy them where the system needs the most. Uh, additionally, um, with uh, incidents like the uh, Atmospheric River event that we've had over the last week, 
uh, we uh, would be looking to pull those uh, outreach staff to be able to deploy in those emergency situations so that we can heavy up as much outreach as possible to get folks indoors uh, to avoid danger from uh, uh, environmental conditions and, and weather events. Right. Because uh, I guess the, the, the roadmap says each district has one team and, and there are vacancies, I guess, in the roadmap teams. The, the roadmap vacancies we're actively working to fill consistently. And then the, the navigators, um, how are they going to be coordinating with the council offices and the mayor's office uh, as we lease up the Triple H and, and uh, home, home key sites? So we are currently working on, uh, on plans um, with the Housing Authority um, and uh, LAHD uh, around the, uh, f uh, the pipeline of uh, new projects coming online through Triple H uh, so that we have a, a clear, um, uh, clear uh, idea of how best to deploy these navigators uh, with the goal, again, of uh, um, assisting both with those projects as well as uh, assigning them potentially to specific um, uh, interim housing sites. So we're, we're looking at, at both ways to deploy them, both as um, a sort of reverse navigator. So if there's a building coming online that um, uh, we need to be able to move quickly to lease up, that we would be able to use those uh, outreach navigators to go out to a variety of different interim housing programs in the vicinity or in the catchment area for a building. Uh, to assist with um, applications through the uh, universal application uh, form. I get, uh, I get all that, but in terms of coordinating with, with council offices? I, I would propose that we would do that through this committee, uh, that as I said, we would uh, propose to bring a quarterly deployment schedule. Well, I mean, when, the, when they're actually doing the work out in the field, um, the, the, the navigators, my hope is that they would be connected with each council office as well. Yes, we absolutely intend to, to work with the council offices. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. If there's an, no additional questions, I think we can move this forward. Mr. Rano, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Blumenfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Lee. Absent. Four ayes, and this item is approved. Okay. Thank you. Now we have one last item. This is item 14, I believe. Mr. Rano, can you please read that item into the record? Item number 14 is a city administrative officer report relative to the homelessness emergency account general city purposes fund 11th status report for the week ending January 19th, 2024. Okay, great. We have Mr. Gibson at the table. Will we be joined by anybody else? Welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, Kendra Leo with the Office of the City Administrative Officer. Before you today is our office's 11th monthly report on the Homelessness Emergency Account, or HEA. The account was established by City Council and Mayor approval on January 18th, 2023 to address the city's homelessness crisis. As a part of the fiscal year 23-24 budget, an additional 250 million was approved for the Inside Safe program. Those dollars were divided in a form of a checking account and savings account. 65.7 million were appropriated into the HEA, which our office is authorized to spend at the mayor's direction as long as we provide monthly reports, which we have. 184.3 million was allocated into the Inside Safe Reserve account. A motion was approved by Council and Mayor on January 25th, 2024, that directs our office to provide written notice to Mayor, Council, and the Controller 14 days prior to requesting the Controller to transfer additional funds from the Inside Safe River Reserve Fund when the HEA uncommitted balance is anticipated to fall below $25 million. The council may change this transfer instruction with a simple major majority vote subject to the mayor's veto. The first of such notice was released on January 30th, 2024. If no council action is taken, we plan to request a second transfer from the Inside Safe Reserve Fund on February 13th, 2024. The uncommitted balance within the HEA as of today 
is $22,064,516.69. As of January 19th, 2024, almost 78 million has been spent since the beginning of the fiscal year from the HEA. The majority of that, approximately 58.5 million, was for the acquisition of the Mayfair Hotel. Included in the Mayfair acquisition costs were 15.6 million in non-reimbursable costs and 42.8 million in cash flow loans. To date, of the 42.8 million, 15.2 I'm sorry, 15.2 million has been transferred back. The remaining reimbursement is expected to be completed by mid-March through the mid-year FSR status report. Based on the timing of the additional reimbursement in the mid in mid-March and projected expenditures, we expect to need to request a third $25 million transfer by the end of February. These projections are outlined on attachment one's third page within our report. As of January 19th, there are 34 active hotels with executed booking agreements and nine hotels with executed occupancy agreements for a total of 43 agreements with hotels, including the LA Grand, whose lease has been extended an additional six months these agreements represent a total of 1,491 interim housing room stock. To date, 1,377 invoices have been submitted to our office for processing, which includes re reviewing the motel invoices for accuracy, sharing with service providers for verification, reconciling any discrepancies, and then submitting to the mayor's office for payment approval. Our office has also received 93 damage claims to review and process. The recommendation to this committee is to note and file this report. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time. Anything additional? Um, can you talk a little bit more about the forward platform, which is talked about here? Um, it costs $2 million per year, or $2.5 million per year and is, is it expected to be an ongoing expense for? It, it is expected, sorry, Ed Gibson, CAO's office. Uh, yes, it would be an ongoing expense. So uh, if, the if the initial contract is a year plus a one-year option, that would be covered under the HEA. Uh, what it will do is the piece that the CAO's office is doing now, which is processing all these invoices, reviewing, verifying, cross-checking to make sure people are in the rooms, that they're in HMIS, handling these motels, uh, items that are actually taking an exceedingly amount of our time because we're not really built for that. It would take over that specific function, reconcile people to rooms where their locations are, provide us a dashboard, information where we can track exactly how long somebody's been um, in interim housing, where they are exactly, and speed that up. The platform itself will also provide customer service and assistance for motel owners to make sure they get the information in there and help automate them in this process, thus making it easier for them, as well as the service providers who are moving these people into the motels. So they'll also have a platform that helps them keep track of, of where these people are and that they're still in their motel and then how long. So. And this is something that is exclusively just for inside safe motels? At this moment, it is, it is for inside safe motels. But the reality is it could be used in other ways for for other for other purposes so it could have been um, used for any interim site that we happen to have today Lhasa had said um, last fall when we were having these discussions about trying to get forward approved that they were actually working on a, um, an interim housing inventory system okay. which at the same time this could do that as well because in order to track people and make payments you have to track those units they were so, doing that last year, a year ago? They were doing that uh, last fall, they were saying. They, the original intention, I believe, from LASA, as it was explained to me, is that they were trying to have the inventory system online mm -hmm. in December. Okay. It, is, it is not online as of yet. And, and that would La just be bed availability? Across that would just be bed, of, uh, exactly. It would be primarily bed availability, but did not, but would not track all the cost and other information that we need to know when we're spending dollars in these outlets. And would that facility. system include inside safe motels or no? They said it, the, my understanding from LASA is that it would, uh, but I also recognize the challenges of 
a motel versus an interim housing site. An interim housing site is a fixed number of beds at a location, whereas a, certain motels are just nightly stays and it fluctuates every, could fluctuate every single day. So I don't know if their inventory is prepared to do that, but we have yet to see a model of it working, so I could not comment on that at this moment. The 2.5 million per year, um, you know, I just compare it, for example, to the affordable housing database funding that we're putting in. It is about that much, but it's a one-time expense. And I'm just curious about what is the ongoing annual cost of the 2.5 million? Is it just a technological service, or is it also staff time to, it, it, you're essentially contracting out invoice processing to another company that also has a portal that you can access? I, I, I'm just not understanding what no, it is. Great question. So it is, it is the latter of what you just said. It is we are using their platform to process these invoices. We are using their staff time to liaison between Motels. hotel owners and service providers and ourselves so if somebody has an issue instead of that call now coming to the CAO's office because that's where it's coming to quite honestly it's going to them and because of the platform we're able to reconcile things quicker if we were to put this in in a, a, a different type of context I will say of the about 15 people inside who work on homelessness 10 of them at least touch this invoicing process every single week with a considerable amount, and I mean over 25 plus hours of their week dealing with invoices. And so- For Inside Safe? For Inside Safe, yes. 10 of the CAO's staff, mm -hmm. on, and how many At total least. staff members do you have? I have approximately 15. So of your 15 member staff, 10 of them are spending 25 hours a week doing invoicing work for inside safe hotels? I would say that's a fair, fair. Inside safe invoicing or reconciliation or documents or um, reports. Attending meetings. Attending meetings too, fair enough. So my, my point is not to say. And that's the entire homelessness staff at the CAO. It is the majority of the homeless staff, yes. So it is one of, it is one of many assignments we have, fa fairly enough. but. The beauty of the forward platform, once it's put into place, it's expandable, it's, it's actionable, we'll be able to do the reporting and those types of items that are necessary to, to keep track of where people are, where they're processed, what's the flow through, and have better information across the spectrum. And actually, quite honestly, be a lot more efficient in cost savings along the way. Thus freeing up staff to do I, I, the additional work we also do. I just, I have to just express how frustrating it is to hear that <laughs> again we're just like begging and pleading for resources and we're all competing with each other for these resources within the city it just makes no sense to me at all and we just we cannot do this anymore we can't have two different systems um, operating two different sets of practices operating for interim sites two different types of ways of responding to homelessness I mean, there's a reason why I haven't gotten an answer for four months to my question around contracts. You know, it's... Okay, um, do we have other questions? Councilmember Rodriguez. Well, I want to thank you, Ms. Rahman, because I think for once I'm getting a little bit of a break from doing what you just did. Um, so, uh, hold on, I got my, I've got a few. Um, from the 36 inside safe operations, and I don't know, maybe the mayor's office might want to come up on this one. Um, how many of the uh, operations have repopulated? Welcome, Ms. Castro Ramirez. Thank you thank for you. joining us. We appreciate yes, your time. You. Thank so much. Uh, this is, I believe, my first um, housing and homelessness. Uh, I, sorry, this is I'm my first interrupt housing you. and homelessness committee, and so good to be with you all. So, Councilwoman, to your question uh, with regard to uh, repopulation of uh, Inside Safe, we are uh, first. Let me. Uh, I, I will share that the majority of our Inside Safe operations have not um, repopulated, 
and uh, I really want to um, say that that has been a testament to the partnership with uh, council offices and also, of course, uh, the partnership at the local level with um, community-based uh, organizations with neighbors and businesses. But we do have um, some sites that have repopulated, and I'm just going to pull up the, the sheet. Um, I'd say about 30% of the sites have had a, a level of repopulation, and at the start of this year, uh, the Insight Safe team uh, launched um, a response uh, team that is uh, working very closely with each of these sites. Uh, Councilwoman Raman, I think, can attest to the work that has happened uh, along the Kawenga 101 uh, underpass. Uh, that has been a site that continues uh, to be a challenge for us. Uh, and uh, again, I, th I think it's really important that we not lose sight of the fact that the Insight Safe uh, program has been designed to connect people to housing and services uh, and uh, to move uh, the entire encampment as a community into uh, safe uh, housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, this challenge uh, that we have as a city. Uh, with 46,000 people that are experiencing homelessness on any given night uh, will con will take a concerted effort uh, so no we're, yes. we're yeah no thank you for that so I, again I want to go back to my question how many of them have repopulated you said 30 percent about 30 percent has okay 30 percent yes. so um, and and again just to just so you understand I know like for myself and mr. Blumenfield um, Paxton and Bradley was the first large scale uh, encampment resolution. We did it. We did it in my district. That was the model. So we can call it whatever we want to call it: inside safe, I don't know, forward safe in whatever the heck, you know, whatever you want to call it. But we've done it. So um, and Mr. Blumenfield did it under the 101. We know how to maintain uh, these areas once we've actually cleared these encampments. So. Um, Part of our obligations with the Alliance Settlement, uh, we just transmitted recently uh, that there was a minimum number of uh, uh, encampment resolutions, tent takedowns, and everything. How many of those have occurred through the Inside Safe program in terms of actual numbers? Uh, what are the number of encampments, tent like whole numbers? Uh, by those count by council district because we've made an obligation that we're going to do that by council district uh, Some of those decisions unfortunately were made uh, without our consultation, but I guess now we're all on board um, You know again uh, cart before the horse mayor's office and city attorney communicating absent council concurrence uh, But we're trying to make sure that we right al rightly align the way decisions are made here because the charter hasn't changed. So under that obligation that we have as part of the milestones to fulfill with the Alliance case, how many of those ta tent takedowns have occurred uh, in fulfillment of those milestones as part of Inside States specifically? Yeah, if you go to the HEA report attachment number three, you will see the breakdown by council district of the number of people that have moved inside as a result of the 36th uh, encampment resolution inside safe operations that we have had. So if you have any questions about that data, be glad to. But so that. have all the structures and everything been taken out with yes. each one? Okay. And that is in alignment with what part of the alliance numbers? Have you aligned them? Uh, have you measured them that way? This is still, milestones? as you know, uh, Councilwoman, this is uh, still a matter that is before uh, the plaintiffs and the, the judge. And so the definition of what an encampment reduction um, is has not been established. Look forward to working very closely with the council and CAO to establish that. Okay. And so um, going forward, I just want to understand what the commitment is from the mayor's office or what the, um, you know, what the future looks like. Um, we know what the budget and the fiscal impacts are depending on what occurs in this next election cycle, um, we could have even further obligations committed to the city that are going to um, further limit uh, the 
freedom of general fund dollars to obligate to any of these additional efforts. And thus far, uh, the preceding presentation, there's clearly no um, maximum leverage being made with Inside Safe to having the county uh, cover a lot of the services that they should op they should be obligated to make. Um, whatever this definition is, and we're still unclear of the, uh, I apologize, but what, what did they call it? Enhanced services? Is that what they called it? I don't know what enhanced services is that apparently we're paying premium dollar for at the Mayfair, um, but all of those things really matter to our bottom line. And so um, given that we are currently looking at basically deficits in terms of, you know, we're, 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 we've got a lot more obligations and we have resources and revenue in the city. Um, Inside Safe has also undermined our ability to collect TOT because we're paying our own TOT. So we're, you know, we're, we're, helping, we're helping to accelerate our own deficits with this model. Um, my question is, what, uh, what do you currently anticipate given the, I think it's only 20% of individuals that have been placed into permanent uh, solutions, that means the remainder of the individuals that have been aided by this, um, we're essentially obligating ourselves to, again, future budget expenditures to sustain their housing uh, in the future fiscal year because we have not uh, fulfilled a permanent placement. That's correct. What is the anticipated cost of doing that? There were a lot of statements there. I'm not sure what the question is, but I think I'm, I'm going to make sense of the question here. I think the first question that you referenced was regarding uh, the LA Alliance case. And we are fully committed to working with the council to ensure that we meet the beds and housing goals, 12,915. We have a gap of 4, 000, just over 4,000 units. Look forward to working with the council to figure out how we're gonna fill that gap. We're very committed to ending homelessness. And ending homelessness means addressing encampments, not allowing people to die on the streets. And I think it's very important for us to not lose sight, Councilwoman, of the fact that Inside Safe has connected over 2,000 people, moved them into housing, provided services. These are people that have been dying on the streets. These are people that have, that are, suffering from chronic homelessness. And I, I just, I take exception when we lose sight of the fact that this is a person-centered approach. Uh, next, next point with regard to the 20%, over tw 2,000 people have moved into interim housing. 20%, just over 300 people based on the HEA report, have moved into permanent housing. That is the goal. Now, we know that there's complexity, right, in terms of getting people into permanent housing because we have systems of care that are not well coordinated. I completely agree with you. I completely agree, agree with some of the comments that have been made. And that is the commitment of this mayor and this administration to figure out how to ensure that there's a coordinated service delivery system that is meeting people with high acuity, which requires a different level of care, intensive care, clinical care, to individuals that just lost their home that are on the streets and need the ability to be able to re be rehoused. So that is, the, the overall goal is to ensure that we are continuing to move with a sense of urgency under this homeless emergency and provide a continuum of housing and service options to ensure the, that people are well and stable and able to be reconnected to their communities and able to be reconnected to education, jobs, et cetera. So to be clear, um, pr uh, so yes, the 2,000 that have been served by Inside Safe, but there's been roughly 15,000 that I know we did even in even the preceding fiscal year um, without Inside Safe. So, you know, we still have a delta there. So it's, it, there, first of all, I want to, take note that every member of this council has committed themselves um, through action than words to actually fulfill that, just like we did at Paxton and Bradley in my district when we pioneered that in Mr. Blumenfield's area, Ms. Rahman, a lot of us have been working on this. But there's the financial factor of not obligating the city to do work that the county is obligated to provide. 
We're not here to replicate systems that already exist and to stand up uh, new baby systems, new baby losses, uh, new, you know, we, we don't need to duplicate these efforts. We need the ones that we have to work so that we're not competing against ourselves. So the, the actual question uh, was, the way I was framing it, uh, was to ask that, you, as you indicated, roughly 300 of the 2,000 that have been placed uh, have been uh, connected to a permanent solution. That means, based on nearly 14 months of data, um, that the remainder, based on that number, that's still a substantial number that are going to uh, require sustained housing solution. Uh, I would assume at the places they are currently uh, residing. That takes us into the next fiscal year, so that obligates our future budget to providing sustained housing and services for these individuals that have not been placed into a permanent solution. So what is the anticipated cost that Inside Safe is obligating our next fiscal year to sustaining the housing for the individuals that have currently not been placed into a permanent solution? I think, Mr. Gibson, you did provide that figure last time, I believe, right? Of what the number is? Mm -hmm. Or Ms. Castro Ramirez, if you have that number, that's fine too. I, I just thought he may have. You, I think I thought he provided it last time. You can you can do the math and ascertain it from the back of the uh, what I call attachment two, where it breaks down some of the um, inter interim housing costs mm -hmm. for facilities. So you have thanks. So when you have um, you have the occupancy agreements, which go for one year or longer, depending on options. If anything that's one year or longer with options, all of those, the cost of that is projected in, just let me have the number, it's, it's projected in. Can you just give me a ballpark number? How much yeah. are we talking? It's approximately um, between 2.2 and 2.6 million per month. Oh, per month. Per month. So 2.2 to 2.6 million to cover roughly the, we'll just call it 1,500 individuals, possibly? Per month, and that includes services or just the rooms? Just the rooms. Okay. What's the total all-in cost? What are we talking about for our future? Uh, what we're obligating ourselves per month? Uh, given that, I mean, I, I, like we should have modeling that basically tells us what we are already obligating our uh, 23, or excuse me, 24, 25 fiscal year budget to having to cover, because we know what. 14 months has given us, uh, you know, which is 20%. So based on that projection, right, there's, there's kind of an anticipated pattern of what the length of time is going to be. That should help us derive and calculate the cost of what the impacts are going to be to the future fiscal year, knowing that we're going into these, you know, very difficult fiscal times. So, I, um, so if you, you can just get back to me with that, what that number looks like. But there should be some modeling, pretty simple, Excel, uh, that'll tell you. Yeah, yeah thanks. We, we can, this is it. We can get back to you with that number. We, we, have, we have the ability to do that. We just, yeah. I don't have so it in front of me today. Yeah, if we but can it's, bring that. I think it would be useful to bring yeah, that to our next committee okay. meeting. Yep. It is built and into our model. And what I think might be useful also, um, and we can put it on the committee's agenda for next time, would be to look at all of the sources of funding, look, look at that in the context of all of the sources of funding that we have. I know there's significant changes in the state allocations that we right. may be expecting, mm -hmm. um, and some yep. of the dollars that we have been initially, we have been using for the last few years for our interim sites right. are potentially gonna be drying up, which poses some serious challenges for us. So I, I'm gonna recommend that we, that you bring that, and we'll agendize something on the next uh, meeting agenda where you uh, where we can have a, a more um, general discussion around kind of homelessness spending in advance of the total budget process. I know that you all are discussing behind the scenes already um, in advance of the mayor presenting her budget, but I think we need to be having that conversation in this committee even before we are presented with the budget so that we can make sense of it when it does come out. Yeah, and uh, Chair, Chair, if it's helpful, uh, of course. If you uh, don't mind bringing that Sorry. Yes. It's, no, uh, no, Chair. Yeah, uh, we just it, want to hear you. That's all. Exactly. If, if it's helpful, 
Of course, uh, we do defer to the CAO for all accounting yes. and budget information. Uh, but if it's helpful, we do have a program budget that allows for us to uh, track expenditures based on the core components. And this is not just Insight Safe. I think, as you all know, we're very focused also on tenant protections. We're also focused on increasing the number of units of uh, interim housing and permanent housing. Uh, so we can also um, complement and or supplement uh, yes. the the report that CAO is providing uh, with a budget that shows uh, the HEA account by uh, core components of our programs. Great, that would be great. Um, and I think uh, some of our members may have time constraints now, um, so I just wanna make sure, make, do you have another a question? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Blumenfield. Okay, <laughs> no, my colleagues have, I haven't spoken on this one yet, but my colleague, you guys have both covered most of the questions just, and. You know, it's still we try to get our head around how we're going to compare the inside safe and, and, and bake it into all, the, all that we do and what is the exit strategy, I think is part of the question because we found with, with HomeKey, it's very difficult to wind these sites down because it's a lot less cost effective as you have fewer and fewer people in each of these sites. So is there a, a, a plan in terms of the exit strategy of how do we how do we wind these hotels down at, without having the, the marginal cost skyrocket? Well, you know, council member, this is, this is year one, right, of, um, of an initiative that we're all sort of working together on. This is a mayoral priority. We have been working in partnership with each council office and uh, you know, frankly, I, I look forward to having conversations about how we scale this program and how we continue to deliver a program that enables us to be more effective with the use of county service dollars, that enables us to position the city for state and federal dollars, uh, and that enables us to, uh, to build a coordinated system across the city that will help us move away from the trend that the city has been on where we have year, year after year for the last 10 years, we have seen an increase in the number of unsheltered people or the next, the last eight years. And I am looking forward to having a conversation with each of you about the things that are working well, the things that are not working well, but I agree that we need a coordinated approach that allows for us to continue to address unsheltered homelessness in a way that allows for people to move into dignified housing um, settings with the, the right level of support. Right, and, and we all share that, I mean, that, that's, and we all look forward to continuing that conversation and, and doing that comparison of all the different approaches that we've had. We all, we all share the same goal, we wanna get there. Um, but we try to understand it, you know, vis-a-vis -vis these hotels, which are, have been great as an emergency stopgap measure, but, you know, comparative costs are difficult to get our head around because they, the costs are, are certainly higher than um, some of the other interim sites. And so it just, we need to think about not necessarily taking all these hotels down, but as we take them down, how do we, this, we got caught in this with, with the uh, project room key, project home key. Where, where as we tried to scale down certain certain sites, we ended up. Uh, but I, I, I would just say council, council member, because you know, as the person that was um, very close to home key, not as close to project room key, because project room key um, was uh, of course uh, more on the health and human services side, but home key was meant to and, provide. Yeah, you know, yes, you're right. I meant I was thinking room, room key. key. Oh, obviously, home key, obviously yeah, not, not home key. Home key, okay. obviously, that's permanent. Home key is uh, making an investment yes. in permanent oh, I, I, yeah, yeah, he, he was I, saying demobilizing it. room key. Okay, got yes, it. Yes, just to be very clear, I get it. Home key, permanent, we're getting there, we're very getting good. them. Okay. All over that. But with the, <laughs> where we got caught up was with room key. I see, Because I see. as we had to wind these down, we, we were at a very difficult spot. We kept trying to consolidate, and then we had a few people left in one hotel. The, the cost would skyrocket. Um, so that's... We have, we have unfortunate experience with that that we need to take advantage of. I hear you, yes. Um, just a question on the uh, page 35. 
the chart, the maroon chart that says um, projected cash available, it has on February 29th us dipping down to 24,000 or 24 million 361. Is that, are you anticipating an additional ask at that point for, so that would be the third? Uh, I just want to have sort of eyes wide open and everyone to understand that. So we have the February 14th ask, which will be to try to, to refill the, the, the Starbucks card or whatever. <laughs> Uh, and then on the February 29th, is that another one? Most likely before the 29th, we'll release another 14-day notice um, to ask for a third transfer. Um, the key components that we're anticipating are the LA Grand lease um, for January, February. Also um, paying out the, or you know, reimbursing for the loss of service provider costs um, and the other large um, component is the is the um, short-term motel nightly stays, um, which, from you know, from I think January January nineteenth through the end of February is is considered to be six point three million. Um, you know that that is for you know outstanding invoices and um, I think invoices received up to January nineteenth, um, and so those are are really large costs. And so the total cost that we are anticipating coming through February is um, almost 28 million, which will, you know, obviously take over that 25 million and and again dip us below that 25 million dollar um, threshold. And does that include the additional Mayfair costs? No, it does not include the Mayfair costs at this moment. Is that anticipated to be folded in? Um, Right now, the projections for paid costs through February 29th is um, is everything that's as of right now. The Mayfair costs are expected to come online in in May, but we do plan on doing another projection out um, in our next report to, to continue to show what we foresee the, the obligations to be like about a month out um, to, to fully be transparent about when we anticipate a $25 million transfer. Okay. Councilman. Sorry, Councilmember Blumenfield, my apologies, but I, I do have to leave um, I, I now. I just have about 100 more questions. <laughs> uh, just, um, yeah, and no, it, it's fine. Uh, um, this is a no, and I, I, we will have an opportunity to continue this discussion. Yes. I'm sorry. Normally, no, I never all, have to all, leave it's early. It's all good. That's fine. So, um, but yes. So, is there a pressing That's okay. last question? Go ahead. Okay. So I think we have some real concerns, obviously, on this committee around how do you how do you make sure that we are we we don't want a single person who's been housed to go back to the street. We share that. We don't want that from any of our interim sites. Um, we want to make sure inside safe residents are moving into permanent housing as quickly as possible. But we don't want that to happen at the expense of people who are in other interim sites across the city, right? We want everyone to be going indoors as quickly as possible. And we know that we can do it better if we all work together. So we have an opportunity to come back to this budget next time. We want to understand what are the continuing obligations just from the 2,000 odd people that you've already brought indoors. Um, because every single time you do an operation, that is adding to that continual obligation, right? And so as we think through, again, this budget in a very tough budget cycle, I think we all need to be moving forward with eyes wide open. Um, and particularly at a moment when um, inside safe services costs are also being borne by the city. And old, you know, we, it's a zero sum game at some point. And I am determined to fight for my unhoused residents as hard as I can. I know all of my colleagues are too. We cannot um, let anyone fall through the cracks, right? And so we have to make the best use of all of these dollars. And that really means that we have to ensure that the county is stepping up as quickly as possible. So we look forward to doing that. Do we need to do anything with this item? Uh, we would vote to note and file, Madam Chair. Note, so do we, we, we don't need to vote on it? We do need to oh, vote on it. Oh, we do need to, okay, go ahead. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Bloomfield. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson, absent. Councilmember Rodriguez. Aye. Councilmember Lee, absent. Three ayes, and this item is noted. Thank and you. And we just wanted to say, Ms. Castro Ramirez, how grateful we are that you're here, and we look forward to your continued attendance at this committee. I think the conversation already today was wonderful. We'd love to have you back again for our next discussion. Thank you to the CAO, and this meeting is adjourned.